listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And I will take in all the ship. Hello and welcome. This is episode 2.1 of History of the Atlantic World podcast. I am your caffeinated host, Jesse Wiest. Thank you for listening. Now, before we dive into the material, I need to ask for just a minute of your time to help uh, to promote and produce the History of the World uh, Atlantic World podcast. And there's basically two really easy ways for you to pitch in. First, if you could just take a moment of your time to write a written review for the podcast on iTunes or whatever you listen to, uh, it doesn't really matter exactly what you write, but the act of writing a written review actually helps trigger algorithms that govern what podcasts get promoted. Now, obviously, uh, you write the review on whatever platform you listen to, but I do mention iTunes specifically because I think it is the largest by far platform for listening to podcasts. Um, Now, the more listeners who take a little bit of time to do this and write a written review helps to make sure that as many people as possible get to go along on this journey through time with us. Now, the other way you can help is to donate to the podcast Patreon page. That's patreon.com backslash Atlantic World. Episodes of the podcast are always going to be free, but they do cost me a decent chunk of change just to do the research and to produce each episode. In addition, it actually costs a little bit of money each month to host the shows online, and so contributions really help cover these costs, as well as to fund future projects, uh, such as the uh, potential transformation to other types of media. Um, Thank you so much uh, for those of you who do help out, and if you can, please chip in and help finance the show. You can do so for as little as $1 per month at patreon.com. Uh, slash Atlantic World, or by clicking the link on the SoundCloud page where I host the site. Now, what's really great about Patreon, that since you can help out for, uh, really, as little as a dollar per month, that translates into uh, roughly a buck, uh, maybe a buck and change per show, I think. And, and I might not even be right on that. I'm Over time, I think we might be getting under a dollar per episode, at any rate. Um, and that's a really great value for the amount of content, especially that each show is turning out to be. Um, I surprise myself continually, at any rate, uh, with how much I'm, I'm, I'm able to produce sometimes. Like, wow, I can't believe I had all that to say. Anyway, thank you for your time, and I really appreciate your support. Uh, one last thing, if you're interested in social media updates, uh, you can find the History of the Atlantic World podcast on Facebook by searching at Atlantic World History or on Twitter at Atlantic1492. Um, it's, since it's useful to look, I think, sometimes at images uh, on maps, I've put some up for different uh, episodes on my Instagram account. And if for you want to do that, you can search for Atlantic World podcast on Instagram. Um, thanks for your time. And I really appreciate the written reviews again, since they help spread the podcast to others. And not to mention, uh, gives me a chance to read your feedback. Now, with that said, on to the show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have long dreamed of this day. I had the opportunity, um, I think I might have mentioned this, to learn an awful lot about some of the topics we're going to cover today. Uh, While I was in college, I studied history, and I've always been fascinated by Native Americans. And in no small part because uh, my grandfather told me uh, a little bit about his father and his grandfather. Uh, And he didn't really, I don't think, he seemed to know uh, a whole lot about his grandfather, though. It occurred to me later in life He probably didn't know too much um, because he might not have known too much because his grandfather might not have known too much. Uh, My grandfather's grandfather, I think in all likelihood, was probably taken from his parents uh, as a child and taken to a re-education camp. Uh, These went by the name of Indian boarding schools. The main purpose of these institutions was to kidnap native children and to keep them away from their families for a long enough time, I think 21 years old if I'm not mistaken, uh, that they would forget things like their native languages and basically just how to be an Indian. Um, At any rate, more on that in a much later episode, but I'm the type of person uh, where if I don't get a satisfactory answer to questions I have, 
well, that's just going to gnaw on me and gnaw on me and gnaw on me until finally I am hopefully able to find the answer. Now, with that in mind, I guess you could say I began working on this series over a decade ago in Athens, Georgia, when it began to dawn on me that one way I might get to actually learn something about my great-great-grandfather um, was maybe by starting by taking a course on Native American history. Um, and after uh, I did that, I ended up taking a few more. And that's because I started to realize that many of the things I was learning were pretty important to better understanding American history uh, and Atlantic world history as a whole. And I, I think they should be taught to a lot more people than they are. In fact, much about the history of the Americas um, I, is avoided in schools. And even worse than that, some of the um, history, I'll say that in air quotes, that students are learning, uh, with the exception of students uh, like me, like, you know, in a university setting, uh, taking a, a specialized class in, in American history, is just straight up wrong. Sometimes purposefully wrong, I think, in order to legitimize the colonization of the Americas. And while some of the reasons for doing this, I guess it might not be all that important in the grand scheme of things to me, like uh, individu an individual's ignorance or... Uh, you know, uh, the government's desire to create a national narrative, uh, an unwillingness sometimes amongst people to confront the dirty parts of your own past, you know, your own family's past. And, and none of that really bothers me. Um, you believe what you want. But I do think that we should replace teaching Western civilization courses in high school with Atlantic world history courses. Now, on the other hand, some of the impetus for doing this, for, for this misunderstanding of the American past, stems from a purposeful attempt to keep as many people in the United States, uh, and probably, I guess, in the rest of the Americas as well, maybe even two, I don't really know, uh, as ignorant as possible about the history of the indigenous people who lived here. So that sovereign, sovereign tribes who are here today um, can be unconstitutionally exploited. Um, the aim of this series is to fight against that and to give us all a good background of what most historians would call the prehistory of the Americas. More on that later in the series. That's going to be maybe a difficult task for me to do in as few as episodes as I think I'm going to try, which for the record right now is five. So it's going to be a tough story to tell, I think, but luckily, I have a lot of help. Uh, for this episode especially, Mark Q. Sutton's Prehistory of North America, Richard E. W. Adams' Prehistoric Mesoamerica, Jerry D. Moore's book A Prehistory of South America, and Samuel M. Wilson's Archaeology of the Caribbean are all some excellent books that helped me to really organize this episode. Um, but with that said... I'm not sure that anything really helped me um, with this episode quite as much as the rock group Rage Against the Machine. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but um, you see, for a little while I worked as a teacher, and there's a lot of reward in doing that. But I also found the experience of history, of teaching history education in a school setting to basically consist of me or a teacher standing in front of a class with some bogus-ass lesson plan to recall. The students' eyes, meanwhile, don't perceive the lies bouncing off every fucking wall. The teacher's composure is well kept. They fear to play the fool. The complacent si students sit and listen to that same bullshit that I learned in school. Now, I don't want to go on too long of a rant about this yet, because we haven't even gotten to the parts of Atlantic history where the United States uh, has a constitution, thus enabling unconstitutional acts. And that's okay for now. Because if you're going to start a story, then we might as well start the story at the beginning anyway. Now, you might think that this story isn't important. And I, was, I, I wasn't going to tell this originally when I envisioned the History of the Atlantic World podcast beginning with Christopher Columbus, I guess. But as I thought about it, 
I realized that doing that would only provide a snapshot of life in the Americas. We'd be left with basically a caricature of them as seen by 15th and 16th century Europeans who really barely understood them. Now, that really wouldn't do for our historical tale, first off. And secondly, I am firmly of the belief that some of the answers to questions that we seek today can be answered if we better understand the history of the Americas, and especially the history of the people who lived here, the problems they faced, and the solutions they came up with for these problems. Now, the United States is a country that is about 300 years old. Europeans and Africans arriving um, a couple of hundred years earlier than that. But people have been living here for much, much longer. Now, while you might not believe you have an awful lot in common with someone living in Utah, say, I don't know, 8,457 years ago, I can assure you of this. That person in Utah lived in a society. You also live in a society. Now, if that doesn't get you at least a little bit interested in what we're going to discuss, then maybe I can pick your interest with this bold assertion. If you don't think that the history of the Americas is important as far as, you know, before 1492, then everything you know about Indians is wrong. So, before we get back to Columbus and everything that's going to follow after that, I would first like to dedicate this series to honor my grandfather and his grandfather, and all the grandfathers, and all their children who wish to learn more. I dedicate this series to Black Elk, and all those who have gained wisdom from a vision quest, to the Corn Mother. These are her mountains and skies, and she radiates. Through history's rivers of blood, she regenerates. And like the sun disappears only to reappear, she's eternally here. Never conquered, but here. My friends, can you feel it? The fifth sun sets, and it's coming back around again. This series goes out to the people of the sun. Now, I also feel like I might should mention something about the passing of Stan Lee, since, well, I love him like a third grandfather, despite never having met the man. Clearly a very healthy relationship. And also because I mentioned last episode that I considered the Marvel comic canon to be my own personal Bible. I mean, what the hell? If you're going to believe in a myth, not why, why not believe in a really fun one? Anyway, Stan Lee inspires me to be able to tell the story of the peopling of the Americas in the way that I would envision that he might tell it. Which is to say that he would try to humanize these ancient peoples. And since he can't, allow me to try my hand. Which is to say that I'm going to present the Paleo-Indians as heroic people, who nonetheless had an awful lot of problems. Now, I do so unabashedly because these early travelers, these first Americans, were the real and true discoverers of the Americas. Now, with that said, to examine the archae archaeological record of the past is to examine a jigsaw puzzle with many missing pieces. Not everything is understood about the origins of Native Americans. We know geographically that many, if not all, came from Northeast Asia. But we don't know any exact homeland or homelands in Asia or elsewhere from where they originated. Um, the archaeology of Alaska isn't exactly all that well known. And, and frankly, the archaeology of northeastern Siberia is uh, even more of a mystery. But there does exist enough matching artifacts and biological evidence to link the people of the Americas to the people of Northeast Asia. But besides that, we don't really know how Paleo-Indians got into the New World. The answer might seem obvious to you, right? I mean, there's like a land bridge. They just walked. Well, not so fast, because they might have gone by boat. 
Now, the evidence definitely seems to be the most direct that they traveled along the coast by Beringia by foot, but that doesn't necessarily preclude the um, usage of boats, and it has long been suggested that an ice-free corridor existed that connected people and animals from central Alaska down into the heart of uh, North America. But to be honest, this claim seems to have been made without really any evidence for it. Um, It just kind of sounded like a good idea. More recent research has suggested that any such corridor was actually closed from about 22,000 years ago to about 14,000 years ago. And only after really about 12,000 years ago or so did this ice-free corridor really develop. So the alternative seems to be that people probably moved south along the coastline. The main reason that some archaeologists think that boats might have been involved is that there's a Paleo-Indian site called Mont Verde in Chile that dates back to about 15,000 350 years ago, making it quite possibly the oldest confirmed date in the Americas. So boats make a lot of sense if Clovis people got all the way down to Chile from Alaska so quickly, unless Paleo-Indians arrived earlier than we believe they did. Now, no boats also, mind you, have ever been found. But then again, with the Ice Age in effect, sea levels were 100 feet lower than they were today, and rising, thanks to climate change. So all the evidence of Paleo-Indian boats might simply be under the ocean waiting to be found. Now, despite this lack of evidence, too, we know for a fact that Australia was colonized 40,000 years ago by people using Stone-aged maritime technology. And by the late Stone Age, there were people all around the world who developed what archaeologists would term a maritime adaptation. Now, I myself am not an archaeologist, but I think it is quite likely that both of these things happened at once. That is to say, some people came down the American coast in boats, and simultaneously others walked down the American coastline. To further complicate this, it seems pretty clear from genetic data and the study of languages that This isn't really just one migration we're talking about. There was at least three separate migrations into the New World from Asia. At least one original migration of Paleo-Indian peoples, possibly more than one. Then, a migration of people speaking the Naden language family happened. And then, after that, Sometime after that, the Eskimo and Alouette people expanded into North uh, America. Now, so at any rate, the most controversial aspect of the first peopling of the New World, however, is the question of when they arrived. We know for a fact that a widespread Paleo-Indian culture existed, um, and we call this Clovis. It's named after the town in New Mexico, uh, wherein Clovis artifacts were first discovered. But since then, Clovis sites have actually been discovered all across North and South America. And they all date to around the same time, around 14,000 years ago to around 13,000 years ago. Uh, Clovis appears suddenly at the same time all across the Americas. So many believe that Clovis represents the material culture of the original immigrants into the new world, the first people. This does seem to make a lot of sense, but it also requires a rapid colonization of the Americas. Clovis first means that the Americas would have gone from zero human inhabitants in one year to humans inhabiting the southern reaches of South America within 1,000 years. That isn't impossible, but it does mean an awful lot of land colonization. So it has been proposed that people might have been in the Americas before Clovis technology was invented. There's a preponderance of Clovis artifacts that have been found in the uh, American Southeast, in the North American Southeast of the United States. So some archaeologists think that it might have been invented there and then spread quickly throughout the Americas by people already living here. 
On the other hand, no pre-Clovis skeletons have ever been found. Not that we have an overwhelming uh, data about the Clovis people, just to throw that out there. But anyway, I might have gotten ahead of myself just a little bit. Because when I say Clovis, what am I talking about? I mean, Clovis is a town in New Mexico. It's the site of the first discovered human remains of a culture. And that dates between, like we said, that pretty narrow time range. And it's characterized mainly by large projectile points. They're fluted lancelots projectile points, which were almost definitely attached to a wooden spear. I mean, they definitely were. What makes Clovis so cool? Well, I think there's a lot, frankly. But first off, is that, like we said, they've, the sites have been found throughout North and South America. And so this widespread early hunter-gatherer culture existed and flourished on both continents. And in the short period of time, especially geologically speaking, in which uh, the Clovis technology has been found, is why there's such a question as to whether these people lived in the Americas and they invented the Clovis Point technology and then it spread quickly, or did the Clovis Point technology wielding people arrive and then populate the Americas? Now, I mean, it's kind of a chicken and the egg question. Clovis people used their Clovis points and other stone tools, and at least one site um, that we've, uh, has been discovered contained a human burial. Um, I honestly don't know how many remains in total they have, but at least one of the site, one of the remain, sets of remains they found was not just someone who died, but someone who was clearly buried. So you might wonder how much we know, because there's not a lot of evidence, how much we really know about these people. And we don't know a whole lot, but we do know what the Clovis points were. And they are giant stone spear points. But they're special stone spear points. Clovis hunters would use these big-ass spear points to hunt mammoths. Giant bison, sloths, I mean giant sloths, horses and other animals, often large and terrifying animals. Now that isn't to say that Clovis people necessarily were big game hunting specialists to the degree that they would not have also been hunting deer and rabbits and stuff like that because they were doing that too. But Clovis points are specifically great at hunting big game. And let me try and illustrate why. Now, I want you to picture a stone-aged hunter, what you might call a caveman. He's got a spear in his hand. Now, I want you to think about how is that stone spearhead attached to that spear? Is it like tied with a maybe a, a, some sort of primitive rope or, a, or lashed on there with leather? Well, that's not how Clovis points worked. Clovis points had an extended base, which was chiseled down and made narrow on both sides. And the Clovis hunter would take the pole for his spear, and he would slice that down the middle on one end. And what he'd do is he'd jam the the, the chiseled down base of that Clovis point into the wooden shaft, and he'd just wedge it in there. Now, you're probably thinking, I mean, I guess that might be a little easier to do, maybe, but you'd in that you don't need any rope or leather, but it seems like that would make it easier for the spear point to fall out. Yeah? Well, yes, actually. Yes, it does. There's a reason for this. Now, if you're hunting a gigantic mammoth and you throw your spear at it, guess what? That mammoth is not dead. And in fact, it's super pissed off. And now you don't have a spear. But with a Clovis point, Your spear is going to fall out of that mammoth. The spear point is still in the animal, now bleeding. And you can go pick up your spear, open up your leather fanny pack, or whatever sort of satchel you have to hold on, uh, to hold your extra spear points. You pop on another Clovis point, and you stab that mammoth again. And you repeat that, hopefully with all your friends, if uh, you're lucky, until it's dead. The Clovis point was the machine gun of spears. And that wasn't all that Clovis hunters had at their disposal. See, back in the old world, when, you know, in Europe, Asia, Africa, when man spreads out to Africa, um, animals are living side by side with these humans for about 200,000 years. They are 
adopting and evolving strategies uh, to stay away from the new apex predator on the block, human beings. And simultaneously, these humans are slowly inventing new technologies, like, you know, spears, for example. Um, But by the time humans arrive in the Americas, either, I think, likely, probably shortly before adopting Clovis Point technology, possibly bringing this new technology with them into the continent, or also possibly having been here for quite some time. Well, these aren't, though, exactly the same human beings who have first inhabited Africa. I mean, they had Clovis Points for starters. But beyond that, Clovis people, by the time they reached the Americas, had a mastery of fire. They used this to their advantage when hunting. They would burn fields and forests, chase prey into traps. They brought domesticated dogs with them, helping them track and hunt, as well as providing an emergency food source. I mean, these human beings were the new, I mean, were, were, were a new kind of apex predator when they got to the Americas and these animals had, had, had no experience with them. I mean, they ruled the Americas. Like superheroes, I guess. Clovis people prospered. But despite all this power over nature, this mastery of nature, all, all this technology, a crisis developed. Within a thousand years of the disposal of the dispersal, excuse me, of Clovis Point technology, a mass extinction occurred in the Americas. Climate was changing and a crisis developed. The megafauna, upon which Clovis people depended on for an indeterminate amount of their diet, became hunted more aggressively. The colder climate greatly hindered Clovis people and their prey from utilizing plant resources for food. Before long, there were no more mammoths. There were no more horses. And considering the climate was changing to become drier and colder, his food sources disappearing, it is fair, I think, for us to ask, what lessons did the Clovis people learn from this? Archaeology gives us a fragmented view of the past, so some questions are impossible to answer with total clarity. But one thing is for certain— Glovis people were forced to abandon their way of life, their technology, its Clovis points, so critical to their success for generations, were now really nothing more than unnecessarily large instruments that took a long time to make and were ill-suited for this new environment. So the descendants of Clovis looked for new ways to live. Life did continue, and by 9,000 years ago, the climate began to warm again. Shifting, uh, then the shifting climate meant that people of the Americas changed with it. In addition, the original Paleo-Indians were joined by new migrations of people. The Naden, or Athapaskan people, began to move into the northwest coast about this time. And, in addition, the Eskimo and Alouit people, who had long lived in southeastern Alaska during the early Stone Age, began moving north, aided by new and sophisticated technology for living in cold climates. Now, that is the true tale of mystery, which explains how the Americas were discovered and colonized, at least fifteen or 16,000 years before Christopher Columbus was born. Except maybe I'm wrong, too. Now, I don't want to get into the archaeological foundations upon which this series is based, um, at least until we'll talk about that at a later episode more, and and we're going to go a little bit into archaeology as we go through this. But I do want to state right now that I'm basically trying to composite as much of the archaeological science together to create something understandable for you folks. And since the archaeologists don't always agree, and I'm not an archaeologist, obviously I could be wrong, but I will say 
that there are enough sites in the southern reaches of South America that have tested dates which indicate, at least it's likely in my opinion, that people lived in the Americas some time before the introduction of Clovis technology. Uh, I don't know how long. I'd say maybe a thousand years, maybe. Maybe a little less than that, a little more, uh, before Clovis technology was invented. But some archaeologists, I, I want to point out, have argued that the Americas were initially colonized at least thirty to 40,000 years ago, possibly as far back as 100,000 years ago. Now, I don't know enough to tell you why I think this is questionable, but I do. 100,000 years ago seems a little questionable uh, to not have any found any, any, any evidence of, of bodies um, for such a long period of time. I think personally, though, it's far more likely that we just haven't discovered evidence of Paleo-Indians using boats uh, that were used to populate the Americas pretty rapidly sometime um, before the advent of Clovis technology, but not so, uh, maybe not too, too far in the past uh, before that. Now, at any rate, for a while it was once suspected that South America was uh, uh, sparsely populated in this era, but it's becoming clear um, through increase, increasing work that this could not have been farther from the truth. For example, it was once believed that large parts of the interior of the continent were uninhabited, but it is now known that people initially arrived in central Brazil by at least 13,000 years ago, and that the central Amazon uh, regional variation in stone tool technology, rock art styles, and burial practices existed at this time. Um, all suggesting that not only had human beings entered Brazil and began living there, but had already started to diversify into separate groups with their own territories and cultural practices. Um, and it is becoming clear that not all the Clovis era sites in South America and elsewhere used Clovis technology, which would indicate that it's possible that they were there first, and then Clovis was adopted later. Um, so I, I guess the real question is just how long were people here before Clovis? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure, though, with all of that having been said, that it's really all that important anyway. In fact, I know it's not. Because a storyteller can tell the same story over and over and over, and each time the beginning would, might be a little different anyway. I read a book once by a storyteller named Thomas King. Learned a secret in that book. That secret is that there is a truth to all stories. The secret, the truth about stories, I guess, is this. Well, how it begins is the least important part. Well, because from here on out, we're going to talk about the real nuts and bolts of Native American history. The beginnings of regional developments throughout the Americas. Um, so I suppose I better do something that I sort of dread, which means this episode we're going to talk a little bit about geography. Uh, I'm going to attempt to do so gracefully. And as an aside, I came very close to not doing this series in a, a geographic manner almost at all, but instead in a topical fashion. So instead of doing uh, an episode on North America and one on South America and Mesoamerica and the Caribbean, as uh, we're going to do. Um, I considered doing an episode on agricultural systems, another on religious be beliefs, and, and, you know, there's pros and cons to taking a geographical versus a topical approach. But um, I, th I think I largely side with the geographical because sometimes I'm reading... It, and I guess it depends on how familiar you are with the history, of course. But uh, oftentimes I'm reading about locations uh, in doing the research for these episodes that I have no effing clue where these places are exactly until I do a little research. And so that's my thinking. Uh, in the future, that doesn't mean we won't do topical episodes. I, I don't know. But at any rate, the current plan... Um, as of writing episode one, is to finish People of the Sun in five episodes. And um, now, mind you, I also thought that Rise of the Conquistadors would be finished in five episodes, and then that took seven episodes. So, oops. Um, so with that said, what we're going to do with the rest of this episode is talk about the regional differences that begin to develop throughout the Americas. 
and as well as to introduce ourselves to the different geographical areas just a little bit. So maybe hopefully they aren't confusing, as confusing as they might otherwise be, um, both these people and, 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 the, uh, and the geography in later episodes uh, as we continue uh, working our way forwards to 1492 and beyond. So first, we're just going to start with North America. Now basically, uh, we're going to divide North America into 10 different cultural and geographical zones that kind of pretty much overlap. The Arctic, the Northwest, the Northwest Coast, excuse me, the Plateau, California, the Great Basin, uh, the Southwest, the Great Plains, the Northeast, the Southeast, and the Subarctic, which for reasons that will become apparent later, uh, is going to go last, uh, and that's going to make sense. So uh, let's go. The North American Arctic is a tremendous area. It's 2 million square miles. And so despite the fact that some generalities uh, exist, obviously, it's cold, has little free-flowing water, and few plants, there are distinctive regional differences within this, uh, it's a, this sizable geographic space. Now, the northernmost reaches of the Arctic is dominated by waterways, like the Arctic Ocean, the Bering Strait, and Sea, um, and it contains numerous seas, bays, straits, inlets, and islands, the largest being Greenland, of course. While water there is usually sub-freezing, fish and sea mammals are abundant. Much of the eastern Arctic, um, on the other hand, can, uh, if you uh, moving on to the eastern Arctic on the way to Greenland, um, can be defined as part of the Canadian Shield, which uh, consists of exposed granite bedrock, there's few hills or mountains, and it's mostly covered in ice. Uh, the Western Arctic, meanwhile, is dominated by several mountain ranges. Um, but looking at northwest Alaska, um, there's also a great plain which stretches from northwest Alaska east into western Canada. Um, and finally, um, it, there's part of Alaska contains the Al Aleutian Islands, which run west from southwestern Alaska uh, almost all the way to Asia. So there's perhaps a hidden amount of diversity, um, at least to outsiders such as myself especially, that exists within the Arctic. But now despite the freezing temperatures, um, the Arctic receives relatively little precipitation and even less evaporation. So technically, it is a desert. It has little biological activity, obviously. Few plants, fewer animals. I mean, excuse me few animals, fewer plants. And until about 5,000 years ago, the entire eastern Arctic was covered in glaciers and completely uninhabitable by plant people, animals, or plants. But otherwise, animals did live there, and they still do, albeit in smaller frequencies than just about anywhere else on Earth. But, you know, there's all sorts of bear, polar bears, grizzlies, and black bears, caribou, muskox, foxes, weasels, mink, hares, rabbits, and a variety of other rodents, all call the Arctic home. And people made use of these resources. In addition, there are 19 species of whales, 8 species of seal, 2 species of walrus, 2 also species of dolphins, and 1 species of porpoise, which all live in the waters of the Arctic, as do more than 100 species of birds who all nest there in the summer, and the frigid waters of the Arctic also contain salmon, char, trout, pike, herring, whitefish, halibut, and cod. Still, the Arctic is less biologically diverse than other more temperate ecosystems. And because of this, it is more susceptible to change. And the humans who live there have always needed to be very adaptable to survive. Now, so if you're like me, or like I was before I started doing the research on this episode anyway, I figured, just like uh, I thought the entire Arctic would basically be all the same, that the prehistory of the Arctic would be pretty boring as a result. But instead, I actually found it to be quite dynamic. And in the Western Arctic, we don't know when Paleo-Indians first arrived, but at, by at least 15,000 years ago. And it is believed that they may have been pushed south as the climate warmed when new Arctic-dwelling peoples moved west, and that's because 
People who utilized a new microblade technology migrated into Alaska around 10,000 years ago. Then, about five or 6,000 years ago, this process seems to have been repeated when more newcomers come, showed up. These were the early Alouette people. These are the three known migrations we know about, like I was saying. Life in the prehistoric Arctic could be difficult, as you might imagine. We actually have uh, found uh, an eight-year-old girl uh, buried in the Arctic thousands of years ago. Uh, I, she... Um, analysis of her revealed that she had been chronically ill with emphysema and eventually starved to death. A grim fate for a child. But she was found buried in a log-lined tomb. Logs were an extremely, value resource, an extremely valuable resource in the Arctic, as you might imagine. And in a world without modern medicine, she lived in the Arctic until she was eight years old, despite having chronic emphysema. So clearly, Considerable care was given to this child in her life and in her death, despite the difficulty. So, people who moved there were successful, uh, despite the climate, and, and without any sort of agriculture or horticulture at all. The hunter-gatherer-fisher folk of the north were living in permanent villages by about 4,500 years ago, with growing sedentary populations. They lived in semi-subterranean houses with stone walls, multiple rooms. It was a world built almost entirely on seafood. And it'd be so cool, I think, to visit such. I, like, I, I had no idea that this sort of thing, like, I mean, Arctic uh, villages just sounds really awesome. But at any rate, about 1,500 years ago, a people called the Thule, the ancestors of the Eskimo, arrived from the West with new technologies, a new way of life, and the Arctic changed forever. More on that next episode. Moving on, or, well, moving south, I suppose is the proper phrase, we're going to head down onto the northwest coast, which is a region that extends from the Alaskan panhandle south to northwest California. It's an area of such abundant natural resources that many researchers have called it a Garden of Eden. The people who lived there lived in hunter-gatherer societies with a level of complexity that is unusual for hunter-gatherer societies with large populations, ranked societies, elaborate art traditions, they engaged in considerable warfare, and held slaves. And so, for these reasons... The people of the Northwest Coast have really been held a considerable attention uh, uh, of researchers. Now, the Northwest Coast as a cultural area is long and narrow. It, it hangs mostly near the coast with uh, high um, coastal mountains and, and make the, the coastline pretty rugged. There's thousands of miles of coastline that contain a large number of islands. And much like the Arctic, there's a really rich... Um, diversity of seafood resources. The climate is wet and relatively mild, and the summers are co cool, winters are wet, rainfall is quite abundant, if you're not familiar, and as a result of this, uh, there's predictable steady rain, a number of rivers, streams, estuaries, and bays, uh, and the largest rivers are the Fraser and the Columbia. Now, from the sea, one might find a variety of resources, including species of fish, sea mammals, and shellfish, both on and near the shore. In addition, a variety of aquatic birds, um, some uh, further off some of the groups uh, of the Northwest hunted whales. Um, virtually the entire coast is actually covered with a temperate rainforest. Um, it's so dense that travel inland is was is, is quite difficult, uh, especially back in those days, when one also accounts for the mountains. But the forest did also contain a number of terrestrial animals, which the people of the region also made use of. And of course, the critical resource, um, as uh, Mark Sutton says, was salmon. Um, and those migrated up every year up the rivers and streams to spawn, as we know. Many of the Paleo-Indian sites in the Northwest, if they exist, are probably underwater. 
because of higher sea levels, if indeed the first people moving onto North America came south following the coastline. But we do have some evidence of occupation by Clovis people here. Now, with that said, by 10,000 years ago, the people living in the Pacific Northwest along the central coast of the British Columbia coast had adopted new tools like the microbe technology that showed up and, and, had, and that had replaced the biface points of the Clovis era. Um, now, we don't know a lot about these people, but it appears they began to rely uh, much more heavily on seafood for their diet. Elsewhere in the, in the more southern and central parts of the northwest coast um, during this time, different adaptations developed. Um, on the southern coast of British Columbia, uh, the descendants of Clovis continued to use bifaces instead of microblades, and they continued to hunt far more than they fished. Farther south, in Oregon, people adopted a generally maritime-based lifestyle with shell middens that date uh, that we have discovered from about 8,000 years ago, which contain shellfish remains as well as birds and, and fish. Um, now, about 5,000 years ago, shell middens begin to dramatically rise in number. And from these sites, we can see clear evidence of growing populations and sedentary lifestyles with increasing political and social complexity and the first evidence of warfare. Uh, in addition, industry in the form of basketry, woodworking, and textile industries begin to develop. Um, microblades about 5,000 years ago are dropped in favor of bone harpoon tips for fishing and hunting sea mammals. And the earliest cemetery we have evidence of in the Northwest dates to at least 4,500 years ago from the Prince Rupert Harbor area. Now, another giant change in the Northwest occurred sometime around 3,500 years ago. And at this time, the climate became cool and moist, much like it is today. And shellfish use um, increased again dramatically, and so too did salmon. And once the descendants of Clovis really started putting their minds to how they might catch more of the salmon yield, which was only available for a brief period of time each year, but was storable, well, things began to change forever. More on that next episode. Now, heading inland then from the Pacific Northwest, uh, we'll find the cultural zone of the Plateau. It's a region of highlands and basins, which extend from the Great Basin northwards into southern Canada. Um, it's bounded on the west uh, by the coast and the Cascade mountain ranges, and on the east by the Mount Rocky Mountains. And so, and, and it's generally speaking includes uh, must have, m much of Idaho, eastern Oregon and Washington, and southern British Columbia. Now, it's a highly variable environment. But there's limited rainfall because it's bounded by mountains on both sides. Um, and, but it is drained by a lot of rivers, such as the Columbia, the Fraser, and the Snake River. Now, the northern plateau, which is mostly in Canada, is pretty mountainous. And it has extremely cold winters, but warm summers and considerable snowfall. The southern plateau is not quite as mountainous, but there are actually um, a relatively sizable number of areas with volcanoes. Um, the winters are cold. Summers are hot, the region is relatively arid, and it gets about six inches of rainfall a year. Food sources include deer, moose, elk, caribou, bears, mountain sheep, pronghorn, bison, rabbits, rodents, birds, and insects. Yes, insects. Roots and tubers, too, were particularly important plants, especially the camas plant, and to a lesser extent, acorns, pine nuts, and berries, uh, as well as fish and shellfish, uh, were, were often utilized. Um, in addition, uh, plants like hemp, willow, and cattail provided plenty of materials for basketry, housing, and, and other tools. Um, now, Clovis people actually probably didn't spend an awful lot of time on the plateau, what with it being covered in ice until 11,000 years ago. And it would have taken some time after that for the land to become habitable, first requiring colonization by plants, and then animals, and then humans. Now, on the southern plateau, not covered in ice, 
we have widespread but uncommonly found evidence of Paleo-Indians, and several pretty spectacular catches of Clovis artifacts were actually found in eastern Washington and Idaho. Uh, Now, after about 10,000 years ago, some groups on the plateau shifted to a lifestyle of generalized hunting and gathering. With an emphasis on hunting elk and deer, bison, pronghorn antelope, um, salmon was also uh, started to become an important resource during this time, though it was less important than for the more recent populations living here. Uh, Other groups on the plateau began settling down into a new lifestyle based around the construction of small communities of pit houses. By 5,000 years ago, these groups began to change from living in small camps, living in pit houses during the winter, into larger and larger villages of more than 100 pit houses. We don't know exactly why this greater sedentism with larger settlements occurred, but climate changes and the new focus on salmon resources, what with, like we said again, salmon being storable, um, are quite possible. But so too, um, it's not clear it might have been an influx of new people or perhaps increasing warfare or some combination of these factors altogether. But more fascinating to me, anyway, and equally mysterious, is what happened to this way of life. Because by the early 19th century, when Lewis and Clark arrived, they certainly don't meet sedentary villagers. And the little-known story of the people who lived in the Great Basin and what becomes of the villages of the plateau is one that I look forward to sharing with you next episode. Moving along for now to the cultural region of California. It's a place of substantial natural diversity, high mountains, deserts, extensive river and lake systems, coastlines. It's all coupled with a mild climate. As a result, it was a popular place to live back then, perhaps even more than it is now with all the fires. Now, like the Pacific Northwest, it has been called a Garden of Eden by researchers. In addition, the environmental variation has been matched with an astonishing variety of cultural variation. There's acorn economies, shell bead money, extensive trading systems, large populations, complex socio-political organizations. Yep, California really did have it all in prehistoric times. Well, except for a curious near total lack of pottery and agriculture. Now, California is known for its oak trees, and the acorns became the focus of the economies of a number of Californian groups. Other resources included grass seeds, elk, deer, rabbits, and other rodents, fish, birds, and insects. And on the coast, obviously, a lot of more seafood was, was around. But The Garden of Eden view of prehistoric California might be a little bit misleading. I mean, acorns were everywhere, but they actually take a lot of time and effort to collect and process. And the great number of game that was recorded by Europeans during the 18th century and is a lot of the reason for the basis of the the Garden of Eden view, to be honest, that's likely an effect of human population loss from disease. Um... Because California was very well populated beforehand, uh, before uh, Old World diseases showed up. And especially considering so little agriculture was practiced, some of the uh, hunter-gatherer societies had had become – had large enough populations uh, to have developed chiefdom-level sociopolitical organization. Um, So it's a pretty interesting situation there. Few clove sites have actually been discovered in California, though they have been found, mostly inland, and in addition there's evidence of in California, greater perhaps than anywhere else in the United States, of at least some people moving into the New World along the coast, and possibly this might have been a separate migration of people, because they had a maritime adaptation. Apparently, they coexisted with Clovis hunters, but they focused on the use of shellfish, fish, and marine mammals and presumably boats. But they did not seem to uh, have, or we haven't found any Clovis points. At any rate, by about 9,000 years ago, the Californian descendants of these and Clovis people began to make the collection of seeds an important part of their diet. 
Stone grinding tools for plant preparation begin to be found in the record at that time. Now, by 7,000 years ago, the climate of California began to really improve, and we see evidence of uh, rapidly increasing human population levels as a result. A thousand years later, uh, 6,000 years ago, people seem to have adopted the use of acorns into their diet on a large scale. Now, regional differences start to appear around this time, which is to say that the human populations of the California were growing large enough that they were uh, splitting and fissuring into smaller groups, which would con- are, were, were continuing to diversify over time. In uh, northern California, acorns and salmon became the common diet, whereas acorns and shellfish were more common on the central coast. The reliance on shellfish may have been related to the increase of bead production in California, which occurred likewise around this time. And all of this, an ability to obtain, uh, an increased ability to obtain foods, um, storable foods especially, larger population sizes, long distance, a long distance bead trade, all of that was the perfect recipe for like what we said happened, this increased social complexity, the development of chiefdoms in California. And obviously we're going to more on that next episode. Moving west, uh, we enter the Great Basin, which uh, sits between the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountain chains and is, includes much of the western United States. It's a generally arid place, but the reputation... It's developed for being sparsely vegetated and inhospitable. I don't think really it holds up. Um, It does contain two deserts, the Mojave and Great Basin Deserts. But otherwise, there's many rivers, lakes, and marsh systems, numerous pinion-covered mountain ranges and associated valleys, and all of this make much of the Great Basin quite comfortable for human life. The environment is highly varied. It contains alpine zones, forests, rivers, marshes, in addition to the deserts. And far into the past, uh, actually, the basin was practically covered uh, with lakes and marshes. Uh, summers here can be quite hot, winters cold, and the precipitation quite variable depending on, on where you are. Um, deer, sheep, bison, antelope, rabbits, hares and rodents, reptiles, insects, and beavers were all quite plentiful as were geese and ducks, and dozens of fish species. Over time, pinion seeds became an important food source as well. Now, during the Paleo-Indian period, much of the Great Basin was just covered in an extensive system of lakes. And as you might imagine, Clovis people really enjoyed spending time there. At one site, Paisley Cave in Oregon, there's even some evidence of a possible pre-Clovis habitation. Now, not every artifact we found we find with the Clovis people are stone tools, and and occasionally there's burials. But um, the length of time between then and now makes other materials kind of unlikely to be found. But in a different cave in Oregon, um, we found a pair of eleven thousand year old sandals. So, you know, just so you know. Uh, the the paleo Indian people in your head that you're imagining should probably not be barefoot. Now, so in addition to mammoths, the Clovis people of the Great Basin appear to have been eating fish and waterfowl as well as major resources. Um, so I should point out that we have no idea, uh, and I said this before, but we don't really have any idea how often that Clovis populations were hunting big game. Um, it might have been a year-round occupation. It might have been seasonal. Uh, I definitely am of the belief that once plant resources started to become uh, less common, that they probably intensified their hunting. Um, but at any rate, um, surely there were regional adaptations that existed, um, obviously here in the Great Basin and, and all over the Americas. Once the megafauna though of the, the Pleistocene, uh, uh, the late Stone Age, the Stone Age disappeared, the descendants of Clovis in the Great Basin began to use new types of stone points. Now, these sites are more numerous than Clovis sites, and so there was probably a growing population, and probably 
Uh, this included a more general generalized strategy for obtaining food. Now, Utah was especially populated. The Great Salt Lake was much larger back then, and people regularly used the wetlands attached along the shoreline in a seasonal manner. Now, it's not really clear where else they were going. Um, now, incidentally, these archaic peoples also discovered that large swarms of grasshoppers sometimes showed up on these lake systems. And while eating grasshoppers for dinner might sound a little disgusting to you, let me just tell you, the caloric return for eating dried grasshoppers is far greater than any other resource that could be found in the region. Nearly 10 times as more fulfilling as the next highest competitor, which is deer, antelope, and sheep. And think about it. Why spend all day, maybe even multiple days, hunting and spending energy? When you could just walk over to the grassy field over there, thickly laden with tasty grasshoppers, and in 20 minutes' time, have collected more than enough to feed yourself and your family. You just got to pop the legs off and presto. Now, as for the taste, I don't currently have statistics on how often prehistoric kids exclaimed in exasperation, grasshoppers for dinner again? Okay, that was probably a terrible joke. I do not apologize. Despite a volcanic eruption that occurred around 7,700 years ago, quite useful for helping archaeologists date uh, things, but undoubtedly a horrifying, if not outright deadly experience for many of the people who lived in the region, since it covered the northern Great Basin uh, in a layer of ash. But at any rate, at least a few of the people living back then who made their home there managed to survive. And they continued to adapt themselves to their environment, becoming highly mobile hunter-gatherers, hunting small and large game, collecting seeds, and their populations began to recover and grow. By about 6,000 years ago, in fact, the population had recovered enough where we begin seeing evidence of large winter camps. And by 4,500 years ago, many of the groups in Nevada had become semi-sedentary, relying mainly on marsh resources of the lakes. By this point, a system of trade developed between the Great Basin and the California cultural world, possibly beyond. Anyway, something archaeologists call the Western Nexus. It involved mostly shell beads, obsidian bifaces, stone balls, we don't exactly know what for all the time, and other material items, not to mention probably ideology and religious beliefs. At any rate, around 2,000 years ago, Vast changes began to take place in the Great Basin. Pinion seeds became more of a staple, much more of a staple in fact, indicating a turn from the collecting of pinion seeds to the farming of pinion seeds. And this happened shortly after the introduction of the bow and arrow, which might very well have led to a decrease in the number of big game and thus forced a dependence on pinion seeds. Who knows? At any rate, you might imagine a number, as you might imagine, excuse me, a number of radical changes took place uh, in the region as a result, which uh, we are going to tackle next episode. For now, let's move on to the southwest, which is primarily a desert region, which encompasses most of Arizona, New Mexico, southern Colorado and Utah, as well as the states of Sonora and Chihuahua in northern Mexico. Now, the region contains some of the most spectacular prehistoric ruins in North America, the Pueblos, some of which seemingly hang off the sides of cliffs, and this has drawn many generations of archaeologists to the southwest. Now, the region contained a number of mountain ranges and many rivers, the major permanent ones being the Rio Grande, uh, the Colorado, the Little Colorado, the Salt, the Gila, the Pecos, uh, Rio Yaqui, uh, and Rio de Sonora. Um, agriculture is practical in the river valleys, and many of the major farming societies that develop here were centered on them. Now, in addition, the rivers provided reliable water sources and fish. Now, the region is otherwise quite arid and very hot in the summer, uh, but many, cacti, uh, many species of cacti were utilized, like uh, 
saguaro, mesquite, prickly pear, and the agave plant. Um, in addition, mountain sheep, deer, rabbits, reptiles, and there's a, quite a few number of rodents. Um, since Clovis, New Mexico falls within the southwestern cultural zone, obviously we have a record of the Paleo-Indian presence in this region, and since the original, and since that original find, a lot of subsequent uh, research has been conducted here. So it might surprise you to know that relatively little is known in the period after Clovis, but before the introduction of farming and pottery. Um, we do know that the descendants of Clovis in the southwest were generally mobile. Uh, they subsisted by moving between various ecosystems and ate everything from deer, sheep, and rabbits to cacti, mesquite, pine nuts, grasses, manos, and metates, if I'm saying that right, for processing plant foods begin to appear about 10,000 years ago. By the, for the record, I, 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 will, I apologize in advance for anything I mispronounce in this and every episode, which... I assume, is common. At any rate, the switch, um, though, uh, excuse me, I don't know where I left off now. Now, um, so we have the Manos and Metates about 10,000 years ago, but these begin being replaced about 6,000 years ago with mortars and pestles. Um, and these become more common, though the Manos and Metates remain important as well. And the switch probably indicates a connection to Mesoamerica, because we're not really talking about a switch in anything but almost really just style of technology as far as uh, which of these tools do you prefer to grind down plants with. At any rate, 4,000 years ago, uh, corn begins to be diffused to the southwest, um, and this uh, results in spectacular changes in the American southwest, and we'll be talking an awful lot about that uh, next episode. The Great Plains dominate much of North America. It's a vast grassland spread out across the heartland, extending from Canada down into Texas and from the eastern slope of the Rockies all the way to the Mississippi River Valley. Now, the Rocky Mountains block storm clouds from traversing past them, so there's not a whole lot of water on the plains except in the river valleys that run east from the Rockies and eventually join with the Mississippi, and which split the region into smaller sections. Now, the eastern plains, which are called the prairies, is relatively well watered and wooded and contains tall grasses uh, with deep roots. Now, fewer bison live on the prairies than on the western plains. And, so, and it was in, eventually inhabited by settled agriculturalists who also hunted bison. The western portion of the plains, meanwhile, is a vast, generally flat area of short grassland with little surface water, few trees, and is often called the high plains. Much larger buffalo herds exist on the high plains, as did plenty of antelope, and so the region was inhabited by hunter-gatherers who did not really practice agriculture to any large extent. Now, in olden times, as they say, mammoth were prevalent here, so hunting and gathering was a very popular pastime in the Great Plains during Clovis times, as was giant bison hunting. Um, the modern bison replaced giant bison, I don't remember when, about 6,000 years ago. Game hunting continued on the plains after these animals went extinct, and that was the primary focus for all post-Clovis Indians in the plains for some time, and they mostly focused on bison. And um, even after the smaller species of bison showed up and replaced the older giant bison. Now, these descendants of Clovis were quite adept at hunting bison, and their hunting methods including, excuse me, driving the animals into confined places where they could be trapped or killed, sometimes stampeded off a cliff, both of these methods could sometimes employ dogs or drive lines or fire to get the animals moving. And finally, sometimes bison were hunted by individual hunters in ambush, who would sometimes use the disguises of juvenile bison. Now, what they did not do is use horses, since American horses went extinct along with the giant bison and the mammoth. Now, besides that, the early hunter-gatherers of the plains, well, we don't know a whole lot more about them than that, but 
They did live in small groups who came together into larger groups in the winter. And in this way, they seem to have been able to survive year-round on the plains. Around 1,800 years ago, bow and arrow technology appeared, um, as did other weaponry changes, and so too did agriculture, on the eastern prairie anyway. And so next episode, uh, those are some of the topics we're going to be talking about. Uh, Moving on to the northeast, a region of lakes and forests, a place great for growing corn, beans, and squash, as well as sunflowers. Uh, Though there were groups around the Great Lakes that survived much more by fishing and hunting than by agriculture. And in the far northeast, groups of people did not really farm. Now, I say groups here quite purposefully. There was a complex regional social system that developed in the northeast because Algonquian, Iroquoian, and Suan languages were all present here. Um, So, at any rate, now... The Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River Valley um, form basically one of four major regions in the Northeast, uh, dominated by a long depression and uh, that runs northeast from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, This part of the Northeast is thick with forests, rivers, and streams, and numerous lakes. Uh, Then we have the Ohio River Valley, which uh, is most, you know, the Ohio River and all of its tributaries, which flow westward to join the Mississippi. Now, this area contains flat, heavily forested areas as well, um, but in addition, there are some rugged parts of the Appalachian Mountains. Now, the third section is the Middle Atlantic Coast, which extends up from Virginia north into New England. And this sits on a broad alluvial plain, um, though the Appalachian Mountains run along the western side of the region. And and finally, we can call them Maritimes, uh, consider uh, a final region of the northeast, which is basically um, the coast from Maine to Newfoundland. And it's the only region of the northeast where agriculture was not practiced. And at any rate, those are – within the northeast, there are going to be those four different cultural zones. Now, Clovis people in the Northeast did not hunt many many mammoths, but they hunted a lot of mastodons, which I guess are smaller. I I have no fucking clue, and I'm not really interested in looking up the difference right now. Frankly, you'd have to be a real jackass of a caveman, to be my honest, to point out to your caveman buddy after he killed one of the damn things that, well, actually, that's just a mastodon. It's a little smaller than a mammoth. But I can promise you this. At some point in history, some jackass at some point did exactly say that pretty much exact sort of thing. At any rate, Clovis people in the Northeast also hunted caribou, and some may have even specialized in this. Further, evidence may exist of a pre-Clovis occupation at a place called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, which is an archaeological site in Pennsylvania. At any rate, the descendants of Clovis in the Northeast began practicing a more generalized hunter-gatherer lifestyle about 9,500 years ago and might have even abandoned parts of the Northeast as the climate began to warm on the continent. The region had generally a low population density, or at least it's believed that because we don't have a whole lot of evidence of people living there from about 8,000 years ago to about 5,000 years ago. Um, but people did, and at least, and, and they actually, one of them at least, invented a weapon called the Adel Adel about 8,000 years ago. Maybe he killed all the other people, who knows? Now, I don't think I've defined Adel Adel before, so if you're not familiar with them, they are basically a stick that you hold that has a notch on the other end, and you place a spear or a dart in that notch, and via the power of physics, A person can fling a projectile much, much faster this way. Over well, I mean, you could throw your spear like, I want to say like 140, 150 miles an hour. Um, At any rate, the Adel Adel essentially functions as an extra elbow. I think that this sort of tool is technically called a fulcrum. But I could easily be wrong. And much like the Mastodon, I am not fucking looking that up either. At any rate, about a thousand years later, the people of the Northeast began experimenting and, and manipulating native plants. And by 3,500 years ago, maybe earlier, some had been cultivated and domesticated. 
At first, they didn't, these plants didn't play a large role in the diet and the economy of these societies, but this is going to change over time. And um, because of this process, by about 5,000 years ago, it's clear that a substantial increase in population was occurring. So at any rate, some of the most just incredible flourishes of America, of civilization, occur as a result in the Northeast. And we're going to be talking a lot about this region next episode. Now, moving on from Northeast to Southeast, we're going to find another region well known for very complex prehistoric groups which evolved there, which itself can be split into three basic parts. Um, the first of which is the coastal plain, which is dominated by extensive pine forests, slow-moving rivers, bayous, and swamps. It was under the ocean during the time of the dinosaurs, and as a result, the region is very flat and sandy. Um, the Mississippi River flows south through the western part of the plain, and this river, along with others, create an extensive alluvial terrain ideal for agriculture. The next section is the Piedmont, which encompasses the hills below the Appalachians and contains a broad hardwood forest of oak and hickory mainly, but also includes pine, poplar, and sycamore. The Piedmont, too, is transected by a variety of rivers, which flow south and east, with many valleys and forested hills, and this makes for a very extensive array of resources and highly productive fishing areas. Okay, so the third section is the Southern Appalachians, which contain a vast mixed forest, uh, um, as well as the Piedmont, and it also contains a variety of stone tools, perfect for tool making, and which are generally lacking on the coastal plain. And that creates the perfect situation for trade. Many plants were utilized by ancient southeastern populations, including nuts, Berries, grapes, gourds, chenopods, sunflowers, and sumpweed. Among the many animals were deer, bears, possums, rabbits, raccoons, squirrels, otters, beavers, waterfowl, turkeys, turtles, fish, shellfish, crawfish, shrimp, and crabs. Now, so many Clovis points have been found in the southeast that has been proposed that the technology was invented there. Who knows? Either way, we don't understand Clovis life in the southeast all that well, though it is believed they were more generalized hunter-gatherers than specifically specialized for hunting big game. And as life began to change post-Clovis, it is believed that populations in the southeast rose and broke into a large number of different cultural groups um, with more bounded territory than Clovis-era people uh, had. The people of the southeast, had, a, um, since they had so much food at their disposal, they began living in relatively large villages by about 8,000 years ago. And by 5,500 years ago, cemeteries were pretty common, which is an indication of sedentism, fixed territories, and complex political and social organizations, since you can see that there are people with, you know, different levels of, 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 of like wealth and prestige uh, uh, along with their burials, you know. Um, at any rate, so beyond this, in addition, long-distance trade networks had been developed, and these village-dwelling descendants of Clovis began cultivating and domesticating squash, sunflowers, and other uh, and chenopods, and sumpweed. Corn doesn't become important until later, um, but the changes that this will bring will eventually give rise to something called the Mississippian chiefdoms, a cultural phenomenon that extended across vast parts of the northeast and the southeast regions. Plus, they're some of the most fascinating cultures that I'm ever aware of ever existing, and not to mention some of the uh, cultures I'm the most familiar with. So you damn sure know we're going to be talking about that next episode. Now, the final region of North America we need to explore is the subarctic, which you might be wondering by now why we clearly skipped past it. Well, like I said, there is a reason for that, and that reason is that it was almost completely covered in ice. 
and was settled by people only after this ice had retreated and was colonized by plants and animals first. And this happened thousands of years after the colonization of the rest of the continent. So Clovis people didn't live there. And so it's a little bit helpful for us to understand that the subarctic was populated by Algonquian people who moved in from the north and from Athabascan people moving in from the west. And so that means it's kind of best to cover the northwest coast, the plains, and the northeast at the very least before talking about the subarctic. So anyway, it is the largest of North American zones. It's over 3 million square miles from central Alaska across Canada to the Atlantic Ocean. There are a number of uh, lakes and swamps, and bes- but besides that, we can divide the subarctic into three regions. There's the Alaska Plateau, a region of interior highlands that contains the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers, the western subarctic, which is dominated by the northern Rocky Mountains and is bordered on the east by the Mackenzie River, and the Canadian Shield, which is most of the subarctic, and like the Arctic, it, it, uh, the Arctic part of the Canadian Shield, uh, in that it is a relatively flat region of mostly exposed bedrock. But the subarctic differs in that it contains many lakes. Now, as you might imagine, the climate is cold, summers are short, and winters are long. Precipitation is limited, but evaporation is so slow that there's plenty of water, though most of it does fall as snow. In north, there is tundra. This is covered with permafrost, with little vegetation. That uh, What vegetation exists is basically lichens and mosses. And there are a few woodland areas of pine and shrubs. But in the south, there are great boreal forests that dominate the subarctic, um, consisting of conifers like spruce, pine, and birch. There's not a whole lot of biodiversity like the Arctic, but there are caribou, moose, deer, bears, hare, waterfowl in the summertime, and a number of fish, which makes up somewhat for the few number of plants. Now, as the glaciers began to retreat about 10,000 years ago, the um, people who began moving in, and by 8,000 years ago, these groups were occupying the northernmost regions of the subarctic, with technology similar to that used by the people living on the northern Great Plains at the same time. These groups focused on hunting caribou rather than bison. Obviously, like all of these people living thousands of years ago, little else is known about them, except that we have an idea that they hunted caribou with spears, and sometimes with traps and corals, like bison, uh, were trapped on the Great Plains. There was trade uh, within the interior and coastal groups of the subarctic, and this trade was pretty common. And trade items included foodstuffs, obsidian and other stones, shells, and copper nuggets. Like the people of the plains, they lived in small groups, but in the winter came together in larger semi-permanent villages. And apparently, during this time, did little besides tool maintenance. Well, that's what my archaeology book says, anyway. And it's got to be some sort of archaeologist's code for sexy times. At any rate, this lifestyle was quite successful and went on for millennia. But then, newcomers from the south began to arrive around 2,200 years ago. And we're going to be discussing that, yep, you guessed it, next episode. Now, well, that finishes up North America... Let's move right along with Mesoamerica, which, mind you, is technically sort of a cultural zone all on its own, but we are also going to subdivide it into different parts. Now, the biggest problem with me talking about Mesoamerica, as incredibly fun as it is to talk about, is that there's a formidable barrier, to use Richard Adams' words, which is going to prevent us from understanding the Mesoamerican past. And that is the bizarre and unintelligible, let alone forgettable, to use his words, names of many of these places. Many of the centers or regions have similar, even identical names. Okay, so let's just talk about, what what, what are we talking about? Many of these names are descriptive, like uh, Chapel Tepec. For example, that means Grasshopper Hill. Or Tutu Tepec which it means Hill of the Bird, that's a mixtec center in central Oaxaca. Wait, 
No, there's also a Tutupac, a hill of the bird, far north of Oaxaca in Hidalgo. Well, to further complicate matters, most of the names that we have for these places aren't really the names of these places. I mean, they mean the same thing, bird of the hill, bird of, I mean, hill of the bird, hill of the bird, excuse me, but the language is Nahuatl, and which is to say the names we have for many of these regions come from Spanish recordings of Aztec sources telling them what the names of places in Mesoamerica were in their own language, not in the language of the people who lived there. And while the Aztec Empire was very impressive, oh man, I can't wait to talk about that, by no means did all of Mesoamerica speak Nahuatl. Now, Mesoamerica literally means Middle America. So, as you might imagine, it's going to share some geographical and cultural overlap with both North America and with South America. And it turns out prehistoric people didn't exactly conform themselves to the lines drawn on our modern maps. Anyway, within Mesoamerica, there are nine different cultural zones. The Northeast, or Huasteca, Northwest Mexico, Western Mexico, the Mesa Central, the Puebla, Oaxaca Highlands, the Isthmian Zone, the Maya Lowlands, and the Maya Highlands. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm almost certain to really be massacring names uh, horribly. Uh, Nahuatl, if I am even indeed pronouncing that correctly, has an infuriating te- tendency to be super difficult to pronounce uh, for English speakers, or at least for me anyway. And needless to say, I'm barely any better at Spanish or anything else, and the problems with my pronunciation are only liable to get worse as we continue. Now, with that said, much of the different zones, cultural zones of Mesoamerica, actually share a lot of geographic generalities. Now, Mesoamerica has a very complex combination of ecological systems, and this is made of both highlands and lowlands. In general, the or excuse me, the area of highlands, generally speaking, contains some of the best and most fertile soil to be found, uh, which is in the valley bottoms. And in these places, extraordinarily complex agricultural societies began to develop, especially as the descendants of Clovis who lived there became better and better at exploiting the limited natural resources of the region to their maximum potential. Now, the lowlands vary from tropical rainforest to semi-arid scrub forest, but in these places, agriculture is more difficult than in the highland valleys, but it also did develop. Um, However, the lowlands also contained gigantic varieties of flora and fauna species, and these were very useful to the people living there, not just for food and medicine uh, and, and materials for a comfortable life, but also as a means with which to provide items that could be traded and exchanged for other, more foreign luxuries. Evidence of Clovis people in Mesoamerica is actually very sparse, though, but it does exist. Now, with that said, considering the ample evidence of Clovis in both North and South uh, of Mesoamerica anyway, it seems kind of obvious that they lived there. But at any rate, they hunted mammoth as they did wherever they could find these giant elephants, but it is clear that Clovis-era people in Mesoamerica did not rely on big game. The region simply didn't have enough vast, grassy plains to support large numbers of megafauna. Thus, in Mesoamerica, Clovis people relied more on hunting small game and collecting edible plants than in elsewhere in the Americas. One archaeologist has even go so far as to argue that in central Mexico, mammoths were rare enough that if a man did ever kill one, he probably never stopped talking about it for the rest of his life. Now, many horses, though, did live in Mesoamerica. These were hunted quite prominently, but they went extinct about 9,000 years ago. Now, about the same time, hunting uh, small animals and collecting plants became even more important for Mesoamerican descendants of Clovis. There's a slow process from about 9,000 years ago to about 3,500 years ago 
And like the people of Mesoamerica continue to live this lifestyle where some groups are living uh, – that some groups are continue, continue to live even up until uh, – uh, up until contact uh, times, which is, say, a hunting and gathering lifestyle. But um, while in, in ancient uh, Mesoamerica, agricultural societies – or excuse me, goodness gracious. Let me start over. Um, the descendants of Clovis in Mesoamerica begin a slow process that uh, – some of them do. Some of them do not. Some of them continue uh, – don't move towards agricultural societies. Um, even in Mesoamerica, there are people who continued living a hunting and gathering lifestyle up to contact times. That's what I'm trying to say. I am don't know why I couldn't say that. At any rate, now, at any rate, um, in ancient times, say 9,000 years ago, um, the hunter gatherers had lands that were the best for uh, you know they had a, quite a lovely life, but. What happens over this time is slowly agricultural societies kind of relegate these hunter-gatherers to um, less preferable lands as they start taking them up for agriculture. Um, at any rate, um, ancient Mesoamerican hunter-gatherers had a very easy life, generally speaking, even by hunter-gatherers' standards. And these are some of the happiest cultures on earth. They lived in small bands that occasionally congregated into larger groups like elsewhere in the Americas. Now, one reason people needed to come together in these large groups was to trade because especially in Mesoamerica, there wasn't really any single region that could sustain the populations that, were, that, that could grow there because none of the single – no single geographic zone of Mesoamerica contained enough wild plant diversity to support year-round villages, let alone the giant cities that would eventually grow there. But since the geographic zones of Mesoamerica were, are so fair, they're pretty compressed together, it was just very easy for these different groups to gather together to trade plants from zone to zone. And the result of this trade is pretty well documented at the archaeological site of Tehuacan, which is southeast of Mexico City, located on a semi-arid highland valley about a mile above sea level and which saw human habitation from more than 9,000 years ago to about 3,500 years ago. Now, 9,200 years ago, people lived here by hunting small animals, collecting wild plants, and they often visited the caves in the mountains nearby since they provided excellent shelter. Evidence found in these caves indicate that families and groups of families, something like maybe two dozen people or so, were frequent visitors. They processed and hunted um, – they processed, hunted and trapped animals in the caves. They grinded down wild plant seeds, made baskets, nets, and other materials that made life easier thousands of years ago. And perhaps 40 percent of their diet was plant-based. Most of the rest was meat. But 5% of their diet came from just three plants, and these three plants had begun, had begun to be domesticated – squash, chili peppers, and avocado. And the people of this, uh, of this area continued to live like this for about 2,000 years. But now by about 7,500 years ago, the human population in the area was still pretty small. But garden activities had risen in importance, from 5% to 14% of the diet of these people. And domesticated plants now also included amaranth and a primitive version of corn. But still, at this time, rabbit drives, stalking other grain with darts, and collecting wild plants were all more important than gardening. Life was semi-nomadic. The groups did remain, remain in one location from spring to fall each year. Now, corn or maize, whatever you want to call it, is an extremely important part of our story. The history of the domestication uh, of maize is a controversial one, focusing mainly on the debate about how it was domesticated. Basically, maize derives either from a species of the teosinte plant that originated in the lowlands then mutated via natural evolution a few times, and then from there was transferred by human activity into modern maize slowly over time, or 
maize derives from several species of the Teosinte plant uh, from the highlands that were hybridized together by humans to create modern corn. Well, either way, what's really important about this debate is that it really ought to show you what sort of people archaeologists are at parties. I kid. But seriously, they are the type of people at parties that I would probably be talking to if people like to invite me to parties. Anyway, to get really nerdy, I think the Highland model is probably correct, since there is no evidence for any of the mutations that would be required from the Lowland model. Though I will admit right here and now that this is a completely meaningless debate. Chicken or egg? And remember what I said about the truth about stories anyway? I mean, the beginning really is the least important part. Anyway, I said there were two locations where we have a really good record of the early human presence in Mesoamerica. The other one is at Tamaulipas, a site in, northeast, in the northeastern corner of modern Mexico, a mountainous, semi-arid mesquite country. It's drier than Tehuacan. But we have a long evidence, a long line of evidence leading back in time that helps us understand the Mesoamerican past here. Um, just like at Tehuacan, squash was the first domesticate, though this is a different species of squash. Um, the same intensification of uh, gathering and gardening activities takes place amongst the people of Tamaulipas. And along with this, a change from nomadic bands to semi-nomadic bands uh, or to semi-nomadic groups and then finally to semi-permanent villages takes place. Now, corn shows up later at Tamaulipas than at Tehuacan, excuse me, about 5,000 years ago. And this was, but this was an improved variety than that which first appeared at Tehuacan. Now, I should point out that this was also happening elsewhere in different parts of Mesoamerica. The domestication of corn, in particular, seems to have been a pan-Mesoamerican endeavor accomplished by different groups of people who interacted and traded, such that by about 3,500 years ago, nearly everyone, every region of the area contained people who lived as agriculturalists at the village farming level. The triad of the three cisterns, corn, beans, and squash, wasn't completed though until about 2,800 years ago, when beans were domesticated at Tamil... Tamaulipas, I had a tough, tough time saying that one. And then, and then from Tamaulipas, beans spread to Tehuacan, Oaxaca, and elsewhere. Now, speaking of elsewhere in Mesoamerica, the tropics, other plants were being domesticated, though we don't exactly have proof of how or when exactly, but we do know that the descendants of Clovis living in the tropical lowlands domesticated plants uh, like vanilla, cacao, local varieties of squash, and a number of different uh, fruit varieties. Villages in the lowlands begin to appear about, uh, develop from about 5,000 to 4,500 years ago. These communities often relied on seafood, though hunting small animals and grinding seeds were also uh, common activities. And this lifestyle probably developed in the lowlands, um, it is believed, probably about 2,000 years prior to village life. Now, as a result of all these changes in lifestyle, um, agriculture, especially food surpluses, began to be produced. And this created population growth. But settled agricultural life brought new anxieties. The descendants of Clovis developed new religious beliefs in Mesoamerica to deal with the fears about whether or not their crops would succeed or fail. Something that had life or death consequences and depended upon factors that lay far beyond the individual farmer's control. Crop failure from disease, insects, early frost, drought, or flood. All the elements which farmers must face on a yearly basis sometimes. Um, it really made people frightened. And as a result of this, these early people began to develop new systems of belief. New religious ideas. 
that help them deal with these new anxieties. Another transformation occurred in Mesoamerica around 5,000 years ago, and this was the creation of pottery, which may or may not have been developed independently or in Mesoamerica and South America, or just in South America, northern Colombia to be exact, and then traded into Mesoamerica, but either way, this whole pottery thing made its way around pretty quickly. And it was pretty cool stuff, as you might imagine. By 4,500 years ago, it was found all along the Atlantic coast, all the way up into Florida and Georgia and the United States, and it shows just how well-developed these early trade routes were, and that they must have been based upon travel on the water. So, over the course of millennia, the descendants of Clovis in some parts of Mesoamerica began living in sedentary communities by around 5,000 years ago. Pottery was introduced or invented, and... Most people started living as full-time agriculturalists. Now, around the same time, societal differentiation began to take place. In some places, such as the Mazatan region of Mexico, which is on the Pacific coast near Guatemala, uh, there, is, there is evidence of the presence of chiefs by about 5,000 years ago. Likewise, Around this time, chiefs began to appear in the highlands of the Valley of Mexico and in the Valley of Morelos. And in these rapidly growing agricultural centers, new and exotic art farms, economic specialization, and large construction projects began, especially platforms and mounds, what archaeologists would term public architecture. These structures required far more manpower than a family or even several families might possess. They required mobilization of entire communities to construct. And this began happening in a few different places that were probably sharing ideas along with trade. And so no single Mesoamerican mother cultural site exists. Instead, what we find is a number of regional power centers that all developed around the same time. But with that said, it does appear that one of these agricultural societies became more powerful than any of its contemporaries. We have known of these people today as the Olmec, and their civilization formed between 3,600 years ago and 3,200 years ago along the Gulf Coast at the Tuxtlas Mountains. It is a swampy region with heavy rains and annual flooding. Rivers allowed easy communication and a variety of vegetation and animal life flourished in the varied zones of the region. It was long occupied by coastal villages living on the abundant wild resources of the region. They had begun using pottery by about 4,300 years ago. They used slash and burn farming techniques, which helped them master the jungle, though they did not give up on the intensive hunting and gathering techniques uh, that were also available to them. The land was basically full of resources, and as a result, the region experienced population growth over a very long period of time, even before the official start of the Olmec era. And so, if you're wondering here, why did civilization start here in the Americas in Mesoamerica with the Olmec? I don't know if there's any really better reason than that. As these coastal villages grew, they began to develop an intertwined political, religious, and cosmological basis for civilization. A complete ideology. And this started to become manifest in art, like sculpture, and monumental architecture. Now, to greatly simplify things before what, going into detail of what exactly Olmec culture was, I would like to first say that it basically comprised of two components. This is a feature that will be repeated through time, by the way, and is pretty characteristic of most, if not all, future Mesoamerican civilizations, which is why I'm going to bring it up right away, right here, right now. And that is that Olmec society was made up of a newer elite culture, and an older, more persistent folk culture. Olmec society was basically expressed by the fact that everyone was born into castes. The highest social classes were an aristocratic elite, which you had to be born into. Everyone else, the commoners, were ranked according to their occupations. 
And like I said, this is a structure that will be repeated throughout Mesoamerican history. And the Olmec were apparently the first people to bring forth this elite component, or amongst the first people to bring forth this elite component. Um, and it was these elites who determined pretty much everything from art style to the political and economic affairs uh, uh, of the area to uh, Olmec religion. Now, the, Olmecs cons- the Olmec elite centered themselves in clusters of civic architecture on, in the Gulf Coast. These centers were made up of large earthen pyramids and platform mounds, which on the platform mounds, uh, we have evidence that they supported perishable structures, some of which were public buildings like temples or feast halls, and others seem to have been elite residences. These people were supported by the common people, a much larger percentage of the population, as you would imagine, and who quite literally built these monuments upon which the elites lived. Now, they themselves did not live in these cities, in large part because of their slash-and-burn agricultural lifestyle, simply just probably just made it better to live in the small hamlets and village-sized communities that were dispersed throughout the surrounding lowlands. Now, Initially, the leaders of the Olmec seem to have been religious figures, but over time, the Olmec also developed dynastic lineages of rulers. Now, these were still very much identified with the deities of the Olmec religion, and especially what we might call the maze god. We don't know what they called them, obviously. And now, from our modern perspective, you might be thinking that the Olmec elite must have impressed these commoners into the creation of these mounds and into worshipping them, right? Maybe. Maybe not. I've said it before. I'll say it again. They don't make religious people like they used to. Things were a little bit probably more complicated than than the common folk of Mesoamerica simply enslaved by an Olmec elite. Um, Because let's put it this way. Just because you have a bunch of free-birding Mesoamerican villages having a great time growing corns, beans, squash, seeing tremendous population growth, well, all of this... That doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. And, I mean, what do you do if your family and your neighbor's family, both growing families, by the way, start fighting over the last piece of nearby farmland? Both your family is growing. You both need the food. If there's no real law and order, this is just going to lead to blood feuds, revenge killings. Eh, It's just going to ruin everything for everybody. So the Olmec's development of a dynamic religious and social organization might have actually been pretty compelling to people who back then might have seen the lack of rulership in pre-Olmec times as just a time of chaos and been really attracted to the idea of someone or a group of someones, a class of someones who had ultimate authority over disputes. At any rate, as Olmec civilization developed It appears that there were people who moved from elsewhere in Mesoamerica into the Olmec uh, orbit through trade and religious conversion, apparently, and not simply by military conquest and enslavement. Now, with that said, just because people seemed to be willing to be ruled by Olmec elites didn't mean they were exempt from demands that Olmec elites made. Exotic goods like obsidian, jade, cacao, and iron ores were obtained through trade and in some cases through the creation of Olmec colonies. And most of what we know of the Olmec comes from four major archaeological sites. Two of these are known far more than the other two. At any rate, they're called San Lorenzo, La Venta, Tres Cebotes, and Laguna de los Cerros. San Lorenzo was built between... 3,500 and 3,000 years ago. It contained numerous hamlets, villages, and small mounds that all lay around a massive civic elite center. Now, researchers believe that almost the entire population of San Lorenzo were elites and their servants and retainers, and despite the tremendous gigantic amount of architecture that lived there, probably only about 13,500 people lived there. So it's clear, if you look at this architecture... San Lorenzo must have been the center of some sort of religious uh, or political, uh, some sort of religious or political capital 
and thus must have had control over much larger surrounding populations, because even if the amount of buildings accomplished um, were spread out over several centuries, uh, it is pretty clear from viewing the ruins of San Lorenzo that to restrict the construction of the city to the available population of 13,000, well, it would be the same as explaining the construction of a medieval French cathedral by explaining that only the rural population of the hamlet that surrounded the cathedral built it. Um, at any rate, the dominance of San Lorenzo seems to have come to a crashing halt around 3,000 years ago with the notable destruction of a lot of the architecture and sculpture in the city. Deliberately mutilated sculptures have been found buried in lines. Some of the greatest monuments, which are giant stone heads, which were probably the portraits of leaders, were actually carried off somewhere else. We know that they were carried off somewhere else because we know where they were carried off, the site of Laventa, which has also been excavated by archaeologists and where they were found. Now, we don't know exactly why San Lorenzo lost its power, but after this, the city was subsequently deserted. Many people of the region, though, seem to have migrated to Laventa. We don't know what happened, but I'm not sure if it was a straight-out conquest by an outside cultural group. That's probably not what it was, because Olmec culture continued and even flourished at Laventa after the destruction of San Lorenzo. Now, Laventa itself had been first occupied it about 3,500 years ago, and it continued to be occupied till about 2,700 years ago. After the collapse or conquest of San Lorenzo, elite rulers continued to build the monumental heads, some of which they had brought to uh, Laventa, which some archaeologists have argued were actually carved into portraitures upon the death of a ruler and before that actually served as some sort of giant combination of a throne and altar from which the rulers would conduct the business of rulership. Now, technically, um, with all that said, we, we, we know that, like I said, there are two other major Olmec cultural centers which have been uncovered, but since they haven't really been subject to extensive archaeological research, we know a little bit less about them. Um, and with that said, we can definitely uh, derive a lot more information from the Olmec from their art and sculpture generally. Now, one of the most basic themes were alligators and sharks, uh, which were two beings that had supernatural importance to the Olmec, who seemed to have represented the earth and the sea, uh, which in Olmec belief both surrounded the land and was under it, uh, thus a watery underworld existed. Now, the Olmec Cosmos also probably contained a storm god, a water god, and a corn god. Further, around 3,000 years ago, Olmec leadership began using the serpent as a symbol of their rule. Now, as a general rule of thumb, Olmec sculpture depicting these, all this sort of stuff is either uh, life-size or larger than life-size, which is one of the things that Olmec is famous for, for the just gi giant pieces of sculptures. Now, in total, of the most famous are the, the giant human heads. We, have, we know of 12 of them. And they all wear some sort of helmet, uh, kind of similar to like one of those old school football helmets. Um, anyway, uh, the maze god had clear importance in Olmec life. In numerous situations, the figure is shown in association with the four world directions and the center of the world. And all of this is pre pretty common pre-Columbian religious themes, that is, the center of the world in the four directions, that is. And anyway, corn thus was, seems to have been at the center of Olmec life, and Olmec people lived at the center of the universe, and or at any rate, if you asked them, that's what they would have told you in a different language. Moving on. Other uh, common artistic themes found in Olmec art include depictions of military activity, of warriors bashing people's heads in with clubs or just, you know, kind of holding their clubs menacingly. Um, another Olmec weapon shown in the art are what looks to be some sort of like brass knuckles. Uh, I guess they're probably stone or obsidian knuckles or something would have probably been a, be more accurate. Now, uh, elite marriages uh, are often uh, seem to be depicted. Uh, artistically, rather lewdly, I might add, in the form of giant sculptures of jaguars copulating with human females. Now, these are undoubtedly some of the most eye-catching sculptures to have ever been sculpted in any part of the world, 
Uh, at any rate, finally, one of the most mysterious artistic depictions found in Olmec art is that of the Birdman. A man dressed in a bird costume, that is. The Birdman motif shows up repeatedly in American societies, beyond Mesoamerica, and I don't really know what it signifies. We don't. We really don't. But personally, I believe that the Birdman was probably a symbol for an organization, uh, a clan or a religious order, something like that, and that this organization, the Birdman, um, were probably connected to trade somehow, but this is by no means clear. Um... Images of the Birdman are an interesting American phenomenon that will be repeated across time and, and cultures. A lot of Olmec sculpture contains what is likely a type of uh, hieroglyphic writing as well. Uh, footprints, bird heads, various symbols appear in different places. In the headgear of the Great Stone Heads, for example, um, we do not have, though, in Olmec times, evidence for any sort of complex, mathematically accurate calendrical system like we will find later in Mesoamerica. And, but at any rate, we, we don't have any idea how to read these hieroglyphics right now. Um, now, with that said, all that said, the Olmecs traded a lot with people who were not Olmec or people who were not under Olmec political control. And in fact, four other major zones of human activity were in some manner contemporary with and in contact with the Olmec. These other people existed at times as collaborators, at other times as competitors. And so while it's fair, on the one hand, to sort of view the Olmec as maybe like a first amongst equals, it wouldn't really be fair to view the Olmec as the sole progenitor of Mesoamerican civilization. In the Valley of Mexico, a ranked society existed that was hereditary at a site called Tlatilco, Tlatilco, that first began growing around 3,200 years ago and was clearly well connected with the Olmec. Now, around 7% of the artifacts found there are not made of regional materials but were imported from the Olmec. Um, though we don't actually know what the what Tlatilco was trading to the Olmec, but um, some, some trade was taking place. 7%. <laughs> In the Morelos Valley, here too the descendants of Clovis formed an agricultural society at a site called Chalcatzingo, which by about 3,100 years ago was a place where villages had started building water control systems and terracing. On the Guatemalan Pacific coast, villages first appeared roughly 3,800 years ago, and quickly populations began to grow. This region quickly uh, grew to have, uh, there was a regional capital here of some sort with a gigantic ball court amongst other important public architecture. Um, and, and it seems to have been an economically significant uh, city because this was along the jade cacao trade route. Now, on the southeastern lowlands of uh, Tachuapa in El Salvador, as well as in the Mayan lowlands too, we also have early growth of villages and chiefdoms around 3,300 years ago. These places also, like the others I've mentioned, contained artifacts which came from the Olmec, so clearly some sort of trade was going on. And even more clearly, Mesoamerican societies were developing greater and greater socio-political sophistication. Now, before we move on to South America, though, I almost want to spend a little time considering uh, one last area of civilization in, in uh, uh, Mesoamerica, and that's in the Oaxaca Valley. Since we also have had a lot of work done here uh, on the early life of Mesoamericans by archaeologists. And in the valley, valley of Oaxaca, small foraging populations responded well to a rapidly warming climate about 10,000 years ago. They exploited a wide variety of wild plants and animals like deer, peccary, rabbits, birds, reptiles, and rodents, though along the southern Pacific coast it is clear that fish were the predominant source of protein for the region. An important early plant for these people were wild squash, and almost immediately it is clear that people began to domesticate them, this squash, upon using them. And these people lived first in small microbands of a family or several families that came together in large microbands or macrobands of perhaps a few dozen people during the wet season. Slowly, this lifestyle transformed 
into semi-permanent hamlets, and then permanent hamlets, as more crops began to be developed. The region contained at least 20 villages in it by 3,600 years ago. Now, the big transformation that allowed these increased populations was obviously the domestication of maize, because once this became productive enough of a crop, the people here started clearing the mesquite forest, the mesquite forests, forests of the region for agriculture, and a focus on floodplain agriculture develops. Now, I guess it might be pretty obvious that there are technological and economic consequences that are evolved in a transition to sedentism, pottery, irrigation, more permanent housing, new tools for processing plants and preparing fields for cultivation. Now, all of this um, uh, combined with the ability to have food surpluses that allow for craft specialization in Oaxaca and not to mention other forms of non-food gathering occupations, um, all of this starts occurring at Oaxaca and elsewhere. Uh, but what I think is less obvious is that such a transition also changes people's connection to land. Their identity changes. This is inscribed in their houses, their monuments, roads, and farmlands, which make the village a different and separate place from the outside world. And so, in agricultural societies, a paradox develops. Because on the one hand, the village is separate from the outside world. On the other hand, agriculture depends so much on outside factors, the benevolence of Mother Nature, as it were, that there's a tension in the culture of villages. And as a result, I think it's pretty easy to go too far in, the wrong, in, in a wrong direction, which can be either direction. In one direction, you are literally sacrificing war captives and virgins to the gods, uh, and too far in the other direction, a society can literally poison itself and the surrounding earth with pollutants and carbon emissions as it literally sleepwalks its way towards an apocalypse. I digress. At any rate, these early Mesoamerican villages typically consisted of somewhere between five and ten households, though a couple of locations that would become early Oaxacan city-states each consisted of multiple barrios, or neighborhoods, at, the ver at a very early time. Now, these early houses were constructed of wattle and daub. Families uh, also would dig large bell-shaped pits here, useful for storing food, tools, and other valuables. Uh, these pits were narrow at the opening and then widened below. Often they were deep enough for a person to stand in and would be capped with stone slabs. Families could save a year's supply worth of maize in these pits, and this kind of illustrates the main advantage of sedentism. Um, after the pits would collapse eventually, or a house was abandoned, they would continue to be used. The village just simply started using them as refuge dumps after that. Now, obviously we don't know an awful lot about the belief system of these ancient peoples, but from examining uncovered household artifacts, we can see that their belief system, whatever it was, took place in the home. Ancient Oaxacan homes have been found containing drums, exotic feathers, shell ornaments, and bodily ornamentations. All of these indicate that the people of Oaxaca had a vivid culture. But the most widespread evidence for religion comes in the form of solid ceramic figures in human forms found commonly in the Valley of Oaxaca and beyond, they depict nude individuals, often with elaborate hairdos, sometimes wearing ornaments like earplugs, and sometimes also wearing sandals. They don't have uh, genitalia, but some have breasts, which is how archaeologists determine the gender of the dolls, so in case you're wondering, I guess they're kind of like Barbie dolls. Now, in addition to the large number of male and female figurines, there are smaller numbers of zoomorphic figurines that exist. Now, many of the females are pregnant. At least one has been found which holds a baby. A lot of the figurines also have perforations in the hair, which is prob was probably like to suspend them in the air as ornaments or something like that. Now, 
These things are abundant in Mesoamerica, so there's been a lot written about them. Now, some people argue they are the representations of female ancestors and that they were used by women for divination and for ancestor worship, which is an important feature in religion because ancestor worship enables multiple families to be linked by a common ancestor, and this is a very beneficial side effect for village cohesion. While other, other scholars say, hold, hold on a second. Now, these figurines, sure, they were used by women performing rituals in the home. Yes, that's all correct. But this, the use of these has a lot more to do with life-changing ceremonies, like the transition into puberty, pregnancy, and child-rearing than ancestor worship. Now, this argument follows that the figurines were a reflection of the sexuality of young women, which was both a resource and a problem for uh, el household elders. And these scholars argue also, just to throw this out there too, that the animal figurines were representations of a person's spirit animal companion. The most commonly represented animals are dogs and birds. And in later periods, uh, dogs and birds were frequently sacrificed as parts of mortuary rituals. And so it's pretty clear these animals did have a special spiritual significance to the people here. But at, at any rate, I would also like to point out that these two arguments don't necessarily negate each other. It is quite possible that people made these dolls to contact their ancestors so that they could ask them about what to do about their kids. Anyway. At uh, San Magote, uh, a site in the valley of Oaxaca, something very different was happening. And the evidence here indicates that religion was growing beyond the household by about 3,000 years ago. At San Magote, there are structures that differed from typical residences and that they were not simple wattle and daub constructions, but instead were built with heavy pine posts and plastered floors. The walls and floors of these special structures um, seem to contain uh, evidence of replastering episodes. Um, and unlike typical residences, there are no figurines in these. Uh, the floors were set clean. There are small depressions in the floors. Some of these uh, were filled with powdered lime uh, mixed with uh, ceremonial plants like tobacco. Um, they all seem to. They were also all oriented differently than houses. All eight degrees west of true north, which is meaningless, I think, except. That if one considers that later public buildings and temples in Oaxaca, this same orientation holds true. So in one of these ancient temples, fragments of ceramic dance masks were found, as has been a quartz pestle with traces of red hematite, which was often used in Mesoamerica to coat ritually important objects. Now, about 500 years after this, we also have clear example of part-time economic specialists in the Oaxacan Valley. People who lived in villages near iron ore deposits started spending a considerable amount of time making mirrors, useful for long-distance trade, and other villages near the coast specialized in the construction of shell jewelry, and as a result, the collection of farming villages in the Oaxaca Valley began to grow, like the rest of Mesoamerica, into prehistoric metropolises. And so to sum up early life in Mesoamerica, some villages grew into cities basically because they filled a variety of roles, political, religious, and economic. Some were more tilted in one direction rather than another. Some places were more important for religious pilgrims, others more important for trade route control, others as seats of political power. But they all seem to have shared in these roles in various ratios. And further during this era, far more people seem to have lived outside of these cities in smaller villages and hamlets, albeit under the control of one city or another, it appears. Um, and this included the vast majority of commoners. Um, now, so it seems like the various parts of Mesoamerica all pretty much seem to have developed to get together, though Olmec culture did seem to have some predominance as a whole. We just don't exact know exactly why. But it is likely that Olmec religion and culture had a broad appeal amongst elites in Mesoamerica, kind of like a, oh, I like the way they do things over there. If only my people loved me enough to build a bigger temple. 
kind of that sort of thing. I think you kind of got a little bit of that probably going on amongst the elites. And so I think it's fair to say that ancient Mesoamerica probably had within it a lot more cultural hegemony than political hegemony. Um, so now with that said, these new cultural and religious developments were mainly an elite thing, and they were controlled by elites, but they weren't only an elite thing. The introduction of settled life in agriculture, as I said earlier, gave these early American farmers a whole new set of problems and anxieties to deal with, and as a result, there was an especially strong adherence uh, amongst commoners to the new maize cult that may have very well, I think we, I think that's probably what inspired the probably the missionary-like zeal amongst many of the adherents. Now, in Mesoamerica, these trends will continue, generally speaking, until later, when the Maya engage in their own radical cultural evolution. This and more we shall discuss when we return to Mesoamerica to talk about Mayans and Toltecs and Aztecs, oh my, and lots of other fun stuff too. And we're going to be doing that in the third episode of this series. Continuing for now into South America, I'm going to go ahead and divide that up right now into five different regions. Northern South America, the Central Andes, Amazonia, the Southern Atlantic Coast, and Patagonia. Now, with that said, there's a truly tremendous amount of environmental diversity that exists in South America, even within zones. So that although South America is a smaller, uh, is smaller than North America and has a smaller number of geographical areas than North America, it is a more diverse place. And all of this is because if, if really there's one way to characterize South America as a whole, it is by its environmental diversity. The tropical Andes are the most biodiverse place on Earth, a geographical space which amounts to about 1% of the planet's total land mass. And within that 1% of the Earth's total land mass, that is the tropical Andes, are 17% of all the plant species on the world. The northwest coast of South America is no slouch in this department either, containing 2,750 different plant species. The Atlantic forests below, including the Amazonian tropics, include 20,000 different plant species, over 8,000 of which are endemic. The savannas of the Brazilian plateau, which is more than 20% of Brazil's surface, contain more than 4,000 endemic plant species. And finally, the rainforests of Chile, uh, Chile and Argentina contain another 2,000 endemic species of plants. And all of these places, of course, also have numerous species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And just so you know, all I did was mention the top five most diverse parts of South America. Now, northern South America was significantly drier than it is today back in the Stone Age. But about 10,000 years ago, when the climate began changing, it began getting warmer and wetter. Water levels rose in lakes, a process that continued until about 3,000 years ago. Um, now, about 80 kilometers south of Cartagena, Colombia, and about 50 kilometers inland from the Caribbean Sea, is the deeply buried site of San Jacinto. At this site, the descendants of cloves began collecting seeds year after year as a part of their diet until they eventually became more sedentary. Pottery enters the archaeological record here about 5,000 years ago, though it is believed that people were coming to this same location for at least 1,000 years prior to collect seeds, probably either cooking them in ovens in a tamale-like ball, or uh, making it into a mush and fermenting it into an alcoholic drink, or both of these things. At any rate, uh, more sites um, in northern South America have also been discovered in the Orinoco River Valley, which is a relatively less well-known part of South America than some others, but we do know that some people were living here by at least 10,000 years ago. And while evidence is limited, it seems that these early hunter-gatherer peoples came here to hunt and collect palm nuts and other foods. Now, climate uh, moving on, climate approached modern conditions in the central Andes about 11,500 years ago. But since that time, dramatic changes in precipitation have occurred over the, the thousands of years since then. 
with dramatic consequences uh, attendant for the people who lived there. And we actually know so much about the climate of the Central Andes, on a side note, from core samples taken from deep inside the tropical glaciers of the Andes Mountains. Of course, these are rapidly disappearing as a consequence of climate change. Now, many of the descendants of Clovis settled about 120 kilometers uh, west of uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador, where the Santa Elena Peninsula juts into the Pacific Ocean. This was home to one of the oldest societies in North America, excuse me, in South America. Archaeologists call it the Las Vegas culture. Here, people hunted large game, Virginia and Brockett deer and peccary, small game such as possums, rabbits, and rats, and also fished along the estuaries of beaches of the region, and began forming the distinct Las Vegas culture by about 10,000 years ago. They continued this lifestyle until about 6,600 years ago, though over time relied more on fishing and shellfish than in earlier generations. Now, archaeologists believe that at... uh, at Santa Elena, the Las Vegas uh, people uh, began to take place in with began conducting new religious ceremonies, um, and they think that because some of the burials uncovered here were not primary burials but secondary burials. That is, a not insignificant number of people were brought to a grave site on the Santa Elena Peninsula after having been killed or died elsewhere. And this suggests that important rituals were taking place here. We don't know exactly how these operated, but it is likely that different households or lineages were connected to one another and that these formed larger social groups. And these groups were connected to specific tracts of land. Besides these new belief systems, early Ecuadorians also began cultivating plants Squash became an important part of their diet about 10,000 years ago and very quickly became a very important food source. Within 300 years in the archaeological record, evidence of squash consumption goes from basically being an occasional food source to a staple. Maize was added to the diet about 6,600 years ago, indicating that trade was happening up the Pacific coast and ultimately to the basin of Mexico. Now, Much farther south than this, on the coast of Peru and Chile, sits the Atacama Desert, which is one of the driest regions on Earth. It is second only to Antarctica in its aridity. There are places in this desert that have not seen rainfall in their recorded history. So it might just surprise you that some descendants of Clovis lived here anyway. No later than 13,000 years ago, people came to a place called Quebrada Jagué near the modern town of Camana, Peru, to fish the region with nets and to collect shellfish. People continued using this spot seasonally until about 10,500 years ago, at which point they began establishing permanent settlements along the coast. And despite the in-seeming inhospitality of this desert, people thrived here. By 8,900 years ago, settlements surrounded Quebrada Jagué, 55 of them in all, This development in human society was paralleled in similar places along the Pacific coast of Peru and Chile. Shell middens became pretty common by about 6,000 years ago. And what is truly remarkable about about these seaside dwellers is that they're near total uh, dependence on the sea. It is estimated that as much as 95% of their diet came from seafood. And in fact, in many sites, no terrestrial animal remains have been recovered at all except for the occasional rodent. In some of these sites, these rodent remains are so few that it is far more likely that they are the remains of simple pests who died in the village and not the the remains of food. Um, At any rate, there is one village containing a shell midden which has been excavated and that uncovered a grand total of four rat skeletons and no other land animals, just fish bones and shells. Now, that isn't to say that all the people living on the Pacific coast live like this. At another site called Quebrada Takahue, which is about only about 20 kilometers south of the shell midden that only has four rats in it, people hunted seabirds like cormorants and boobies. Fish bones, sea mammals, and shells were relatively rare. 
Butchered, burned, and cut bones of seabirds, on the other hand, fill a large midden. Mostly adult birds, indicating these people netted or stalked them in shallow waters, rather than capturing juveniles from rookeries. Now, all this food is great and all, but you might be wondering where people got water in such an arid place. Well, we have evidence of how they got water from another coastal site, Quebrada de los Burros, which has a small but permanent spring attached to it. The people here must have had a really a lot more fun at dinner time, I think, in my opinion, than some of their neighbors, because the people of Quebrada de los Burros used a diverse assortment of mollusks, crabs and sea urchins, fish and birds, as well as hunted large terrestrial game like deer that were probably attracted to the spring. And so, from these localized differences within the desert, we see two different strategies evolve. First, The people without access to a lot of water remained more mobile than people who lived at more dependable watering holes, obviously, um, and who these people became increasingly sedentary. Amongst these sedentary groups, we start seeing some profound changes in their belief system about 7,000 years ago. And at that time, we start seeing artificial mummification along the Chilean coast, which is a set of practices that changes over time but is going to continue here for about 4,000 years. Now, the earliest mummies found are called the black mummies. The mummification process began after death to create a black mummy, which is when a person would be put in a wet bog until their flesh decayed, and at which point the bones would be dug up and cleaned. The skull and other bones were reassembled and connected with reed cords and wooden poles, and this frame was then covered with grayish clay. Facial features and genitalia were added, as were any remaining bits of skin, and this would be patched together with animal hide. Sometimes, though, the person's facial skin was actually pre-removed prior to them being originally buried and then reattached to the mummy. And then finally, the mummy would be covered in a blue-gray layer of manganese paste. And this was the preferred method of mummification in the region until about 5,000 years ago. Uh, which is when the so-called black mummies were replaced by the so-called red mummies. Now, these actually require a little less preparation than black mummies, though they're still quite stunning creation. And and if you are interested, I guess, in making your own red mummy, obviously what you do is you start with a corpse. And the first thing you do is extract the organs and muscles from said corpse by cutting open slits in the deceased person's knees, ankles, shoulders, and groin. After this is done, remove the skull, and after all organs are removed, the inside of the body needs to be dried, so you're going to fill it with hot coals. And after the corpse has been dried out, you need to add a supporting framework by sliding long poles underneath the skin of the deceased. Now you're going to, after that, you stuff the person with feathers, dirt, and hair from a handy camel or alpaca. So next, you're gonna need, you need the skull still. I hope you didn't just toss it out with the other organs. The skull is not an organ. And besides, we need it now because we're going to need to put a shoulder-length wig of human hair, and we're going to glue this to the skull. Now, always remember, camel or alpaca hair is for stuffing inside the course, corpse. Human hair is for the wig. Okay, so you also need a little more clay. Uh, we're going to make a clay face and put that on the skull. Make sure you leave slots open for the eyes and leave the mouth open so everyone can see the mummy's teeth. And if they're missing any, you can replace these with some, with some gemstones or something like that to make sure they really gleam. Finally, after all of this, you're going to paint the mummy with red ochre except for the face and hair. And presto, well, you've got yourself a red mummy. Well, so this becomes the new preferred method of making mummies here for another five centuries. And, and, and mummies really interest me. So frankly, I could go on about them unlike pottery, which I try to avoid talking about as much as possible. But I think I better not carry carry too far away. Needless to say, the mummy traditions on the Pacific coast of the Atacama Desert are super fun to learn about, and they also show us that the people living here had really complex notions about living with the dead. We don't know exactly how they felt about them, but at a minimum, the people who lived here obviously viewed their own mortality as something beyond bilateral terms of life and death. I suspect some sort of ancestor veneration was practiced, although if this was the case, it was different than later Inca examples of this, 
who uh, we'll talk about this when we get to the Inca, but they routinely take their mummies out of the crypts where they are buried to have conversations or to parade them about. Um, in contrast, these early coastal mummies were elaborately prepared, likely admired for some time, but after that were wrapped in reed fiber shrouds and buried in cemeteries. Now, one last point I'd like to make about this before moving on is we do see a lot of infant mummification uh, in the Atacama Desert. Ironically, the same environmental conditions which made the creation of these mummies possible also led to a number of the people here getting sick from arsenic poisoning, something that can especially affect the mortality rate and development of newborns. The fresh water that was found in springs and oases along the desert coast in northern Chile, some of it contained trace amounts of toxins in addition to the clays available. Yep. At any rate, not all of the coast was full of poison. Uh, I mean, in southern Peru, uh, in contrast, significantly less arsenic is in the rivers here. And the people um, had lived here for at least 12,000 years in a place called the Osmor Valley. Um, here we have a site that archaeologists have worked on, have worked on, which is unfortunately named Kilometer Foresight, named for its proximity to a nearby railroad line and station. I'll be honest. If I believed in vengeance, I would bother learning the name of whoever named Kilometer Foresight, Kilometer Foresight, so that you too could also be spiteful towards them for leaving us with that name. But anyway, like elsewhere along the coast, people began first seasonally hunting and fishing before eventually settling down into villages. Besides fishing and uh, some hunting, the people of Kilometer 4 likely spent a good amount of time working with cotton or trading this good, as domesticated cotton is also found here. So too are some of the mummies we have been discussing, though other funeral treatments were also practiced, and so southern Peru seems to be likely a cultural front, a frontier culture zone for the mummy-making fisher folk of the Pacific coast. Now, not everyone who lived in the central Andes, lived on the coast. Other descendants of Clovis made their home in the southern Peruvian mountains, about 125 kilometers upriver from the coast. And this is where the site of Asana is, where human dwellings exist to date back 10,500 years ago. These people continued to live at the site for thousands of years, near a spring-fed spring -fed grassy area, which was perfect for hunting and gathering. About 5,000 years ago, though, a change occurred in the culture of Asana. Dwellings became larger, about twice as large as they had previously been for thousands of years. And these new buildings appear to be some sort of ritual building or temple with packed clay floors, specially prepared, and often with tiny miniature artifacts like miniature frames of huts, tiny spear points. We don't know what the purpose of these are, but there were also small pits in the floors of these buildings that contained special stones, pyramidal in shape, often split uh, to expose the shining geodes that were inside. Now, what all of this meant? Man, that we really don't know about this one. Um, it's a total mystery. But um, about 5,000 years ago, um, the people of Asana were glitter arraying glittering stones in specific ways in temples. And why they did so is a mystery, but they also stopped a thousand years later, and that too is a mystery. Asana continued to be occupied, but the people living here stopped building these ancient religious buildings. And that wasn't the only change in the, for the people of Asana. Their economy changed too, from being primarily hunters of camelids to herders of camelids. By 4,400 years ago, the domestication of camels and alpacas had taken place in South America. Now, we're going to move along from that from now to talk about Amazonia, because Amazonia is an amazing place. Now, for starters, the Amazon River and its more than 1,000 tributaries form the largest river system on Earth, which drains 40% of the continent. It is second in length only to the Nile, and its discharge is so incredible that at any given time, 20% of all free-flowing fresh water on the Earth is right at this very second flowing from out of the mouth of the Amazon. Now, unlike the Andes, where we have a great record of the past climate, we have very we have much less knowledge about the about Amazonia, and frankly, it's almost impossible 
to try and generalize about it uh, for the entire region. It's, it's far too large and with dramatic localized differences. Now, you'd think that researchers would be able to obtain a wealth of data from studying the rainforest, and they have. It's just that some of the results of scientists researching this natural re- rainforest just isn't what they or you might expect. For example, the results of a study conducted at a site called Peña Roja, which lays on the Rio Caqueta, a tributary of the Amazon River, um, shows that the excavations shown done here show that um, these were done to contest a hypothesis that hunter-gatherers did not live in tropical rainforests, which is an idea based on ethnographic cases in which modern tropical rainforest collector societies also have access to agricultural crops. Instead, excavations found that people had been living here since at least 9,300 years ago. Thus, the hypothesis was false, and a number of the artifacts found at the site indicate the importance of plant foods for these early people, specifically fruits and nuts of different types of palm trees. The people of Peña Roja had a complex set of tools dealing with plants, yet none of the biological evidence indicates that they use domesticated plants. Things start to become, started to become more clear for how, we, uh, how to understand this in the 1980s. This time, archaeologists performed a detailed analysis of a group called the Nukak. The Nukak are a small tribe who had basically managed to remain uncontacted with the so-called modern world until the 1980s, and whose lifestyle seems probably very similar to the early, enduring, early and enduring ways of life first developed thousands of years earlier. Now, in the late 1980s, the Nukak numbered somewhere between 400 and 500 people, and they lived in independent bands, each consisting of five or fewer families, and uh, basically 12 to 44 people who ranged a territory of over 10,000 square miles, uh, excuse me, 10,000 square kilometers. Uh, incidentally, that's about 3,860 miles from my fellow Americans. Now, they, the, the, these people had a lack of hier- hierarchical organization, strong solidarity patterns, and high residential mobility. And even in the 1980s, less than 5% of the NUCAC diet was based on domesticated plants. They occupied each camp they stayed at for three to four days at a time and then moved on for an average of about five miles distance to the next camp. Nukak people leave these camps daily to collect food and other forest products in an irregular loop around the camp, always returning before nightfall, except for special journeys by groups of men who collected the canes for blowgun pipes, which grew at a specific cluster of rocky hills. Now, while all this may seem like a pretty simple lifestyle, delightfully simple, in fact, perhaps, it is nonetheless one that has profound effects on the surrounding region. The Nukak use, in total, 113 species of plants. 23 of these are domesticated. Most are recent additions from missionaries. But the majority of the plants they used, 90 in all, come from the rainforest. The Nukak continuously drop wild, pe- seed, wild palm seeds at their camps, And so the camps end up scattered with edible palm nuts, and these seeds mix in with the rich organic materials of the campsite, like charcoal from the fire pits, human waste, and other debris. And all of this slowly forms together to form a dark organic soil known to us as terra preta, or dark earth. And these soils create an ideal environment for plants. This has the effect of creating wild orchards in the Amazonian rainforest and transforms large areas of land continuously. And I I almost hesitate to use the word wild orchards because this is aided by the Nukak's cutting down of palm trees to acquire nuts, which opens up areas of shaded forest to sunlight and new growth. At the site of Peña Roja, in far western Amazonia, Evidence indicates that even thousands of years earlier, the people of this region lived in a very similar way to the Nukak of the 1980s. The descendants of Clovis, who lived here, built the Amazon rainforest. 
if we can, move on to the southern Atlantic coast of South America. Here, we uh, this region hosts a complex mosaic of habitats, including palm forests, prairies, coastal wetlands, salt marshes, and lagoons. Um, around the end of the Stone Age, about 4,000 years ago, the climate began getting wetter here, and this climate became more stabilized uh, over time and became a very ideal place for human habitation. And people, of course, promptly began to establish large and relatively permanent settlements on hills and knolls above the floodplains with easy access to the diverse resources of the coastal wetlands. Now, along the coastline of Brazil and northern Uruguay, the descendants of Clovis began to exploit the sea in similar ways to the people of the Pacific coast, that is, eating seafood and building large sail mounds, which they created and are still visible today. In Brazil, these are known as sambaquis, and some of them are gigantic, over 50 meters tall and 200 meters square at the base, though most are much smaller. They consist of mollusk shells and other materials, and seem to have been created for a variety of purposes. Some are burial mounds, others represent residential areas, and some seem to have been intentionally constructed monuments, perhaps to mark territory. Hundreds of them still exist and have been examined by archaeologists, including some which are now underwater, which date uh, beyond 8,000 years ago, I believe. Most Sambakis, though, were created between 5,000 and 2,000 years ago. And originally it was believed that the Sambakis were remains of seasonal camps, of mobile fisher folk who camped the dry spots near lagoons and bays, stayed a while, gathered their trash in a big pile, moved on, and would return the next year. But through further research, it's become increasingly clear that these Sambankis were actually created by people who lived a sedentary lifestyle. They fished with nets, collected mollusks, occasionally hunted dolphins and whales, and hunted and perhaps also cultivated a number of plants from the forest, and also spent quite a bit of time creating an extremely detailed ornaments from bone and stone, mostly animal icons, both land and sea animals. I should say cats, armadillos, eagles, sharks, whales, and penguins are the most common themes. Now, uh, one site where some, you know, I've tried to go in, you know, I've tried to avoid too much detailed analysis of specific sites, but we're going to dive into one here. It's called Jabutakabira 2. I clearly picked it so I could say the name. A site on the Camacho Lagoon on the coast of southern Brazil. Now, by excavating it, archaeologists, um, which are, and this was made possible after modern construction companies barrowed into some of the mounds in order to use the shell and other materials as modern building materials. And as a result, archaeologists were able to learn a startling amount about the people who made these sambakis and the purposes for which they were built. Now, first off, the cuts in the mounds show that they were built using a sequence of mounded layers, a thick strata of shells that were capped by another thick layer. This was a thick layer of organic material and charcoal. Now, burials were clustered in discrete areas on top of the dark layer, and many of these graves held secondary burials, that is, people who, like we said elsewhere, died elsewhere but were brought back to this place, home. The deceased were laid in shallow pits, accompanied by everyday artifacts or jewelry made of bone or stone. Some bodies were covered in red pigment, and the mounds themselves contained post holes, which is to say there was some sort of windscreen or funerary scaffoldings on top of these mounds, maybe as a spot to place offerings to the deceased. Uh, in addition, a high density of food refuse, like bones of fish, land mammals, sea mammals, marine birds, all suggest that it seems that people probably feasted with their dead relatives at these mounds. And we don't know ex the exact process of why, but over time, large hearth hearths were constructed, the entire mound would be burned, and subsequently capped with heaps of shells. And over time, this created a large number of sambakis. Now, this was a popular cultural practice for the people here for about 800 years. And during this time, just at the site of uh, Jetu Cabiera II, mind you, this was happening all along the coast, about 43,000 people were buried at uh, Jacu Cabiera II. Now, 
once Jakku Tabira II was excavated, people really started taking a look at some of the other Sembakis, and it soon became clear, if for no other reason than the dense concentration of burials that were present, that these people had to have lived a settled lifestyle. Firsthand, the skeletons, which have been uh, examined, show teeth with a great deal of wear, something consistent with people who ingest grit and sand, a common problem for early agricultural people as a result of their grinding grain down with stone tools. Um, In addition, the bones exhibit lesions produced by infectious diseases, which is another marker of sedentary populations living with high population density. Now, the final part of the region of South America we need to consider is Patagonia, a little understood the little understood southern reaches of of South America. And it was seen by outsiders like me to be an inhospitable place. Um, This is not true. Five different principal geographical zones exist within Patagonia, basically based on uh, elevation, the highest being the Andean tundra, located above this tree line and almost completely without precipitation, and then down, uh, going uh, sloping downwards towards the east, toward the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, by the time you get there, you're in an area which receives between 8 and 16 inches of rain each year. Um, descendants of Clovis made their homes here, uh, did so by continuing to hunt megafauna for a longer period of time than any of their contemporaries in North or South America. A lot of the species of big game, like giant ground sloth, horses, armadillo, giant armadillo, that is, and camelids survived here for a longer period of time than anywhere else in the Americas. Archaeologists uncovered human burials at a site called Arroyo Secto II that date back about 12,200 years, and the site continued to be occupied for the next 5,000 years. Excuse me. The inhabitants here used atlatls and bolas to hunt, and as megafauna disappeared, they relied more on deer, capybara, Pecari and Guanaco. And we don't know, like all the hunter, early hunter-gatherer societies, much more than this. But we do know they were buried in red ochre. They often wore necklaces of wolf or dog teeth. And it's so obviously it's assumed these people held dogs with special spiritual significance. And um, Now, with all that said, one type of menof- megafauna did not go extinct in South America. Even today, four species of camelids live, that is, camels and alpacas, that come from South America. Two are wild, two have been domesticated. And like the ancient hunters of the Andes who likewise hunted these animals, uh, the people of Arroyo Seco too uh, also played a role in the process, uh, the not very well understood process, that led to the domestication of camels and alpacas. Now, all in some, these different regional surveys don't give us a comprehensive view of early life in the South American content, continent, but they do give us a sense of the tremendous variation and diversity that existed there, I think, as well as the as an idea of the sorts of changes that begin taking place as people begin to develop new lifestyles, including sed- settled agriculture in some areas. Uh, in some cases, and uh, the dramatic changes in social structure and religious beliefs that uh, take place with with things like sedentism and agricultural life. Now, we've still got a lot of ground to cover with South America. We are absolutely not done talking about mummies, for example. Of course, we will be spending a good amount of time discussing the Inca. That won't be happening for a little while, episode 2.4 to be exact, Uh, and that's when we're going to return to South America, essentially mankind's final frontier. Well, except for the Caribbean, which we are left with. Um, Don't worry, I didn't forget about it. Well, I think we can basically define the Caribbean into two separate spheres, the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles. The mostly larger, more northern islands are the Greater Antilles, uh, the Lesser Antilles being the much smaller and more southern islands. Now, with that said, the Caribbean island kind of conveniently forms almost a nearly linear line, um, and that's really nice. And one main difference is that the people who lived on the Lesser Antilles were dependent upon seafood for their survival, on the great, whereas on the Greater Antilles, there were populations whose almost entire diet was land resources. Cuba, the largest island in the chain, is almost ten times the size of all the islands of the Lesser Antilles combined which, when added together, are about 12,000 square kilometers. 
the Greater Antilles are about 194,000 square kilometers. Now, the environment was quite a bit different in the pre-Columbian days. After contact, entire islands were were cleared of tropical forests for large-scale agricultural projects. This continues today with tourism development. Um, Further, much of the flora and fauna in the Caribbean was quite different, as you might imagine. Uh, But with with all that in mind, um, climate was very important in the Caribbean. Uh, Seasonal changes, though, obviously more important than temperature variation, uh, in, in the fact that rains were seasonal. There is a dry and a wet season that occurs every year. Precipitation itself can also vary widely, not just even from island to island, but on individual islands because of altitude changes, and depending on whether one is on the windward or leeward side of the island. Speaking of precipitation, hurricane is a Taino word. The storm season was marked on later Caribbean calendars and was mythologically significant even to the earliest Caribbean cultures as were a number of different sea creatures and birds. And while it's... So while it's easy... And one other thing. While it's easier for us to think of these islands as isolated places, perhaps especially if you just listened to the first series, Rise of the Conquistadors, and got to know how isolated the Guanche people of individual Canary Islands were. But the canoe-born people who colonized the Caribbean, uh, for them, the, the water between the islands were not barriers, but connections. It was often easier to make use of the facing coast and the next island in the chain um, than it is was to travel all the way around to the opposite side of one's own island. And so the development of trade and societies in the Caribbean reflect that. The lack of surface area on the Lesser Antilles required inter-island uh, mobility for people to survive, in fact. For example, on Antigua, there is a a, a chert source, or flint, as some of you might call it, which is a great rock for making stone tools like arrowheads. And and the the chert source of Antigua was used by people in a trade network which went for hundreds of kilometers up and down the archipelago. Now, just as important as trading materials for these people were the opportunities that island-to-island travel bought for intermarriage, sharing language and culture, and just to keep in touch, generally, with one's neighbors. In contrast to the Lesser Antilles, though, the large river valleys that existed in some of the Greater Antilles meant that over time, incredibly dense populations could and did develop, and so considerable cultural diversity could exist even within individual islands of the Greater Antilles. Whereas on the Lesser Antilles, a shared culture amongst multiple islands was more the norm. I guess that makes this pretty much the perfect time to start talking about who exactly we are talking about here. Uh, The Taino are one of the two ethnic groups, to use modern technology, that Columbus and other Europeans will encounter upon reaching the Caribbean, the other being a people called the Caribs. But um, originally, people... But the, they weren't necessi- the, the Taino was not a, an ethnic group that simply just came to the Caribbean all by itself. The original first inhabitants of the Caribbean came from two separate places, from the Yucatan towards the Greater Antilles, and from the northeast corner of South America towards the Lesser Antilles. Now, the earliest inhabitants relied on land mammals to a much larger extent uh, than their descendants. Fishing might not even have been practiced by much by the early people who left the Yucatan to the Greater Antilles, Um, though they did collect shellfish, and that played a small role, uh, although this played a smaller role, I should say, than hunted land animals. But generations of experience led people towards fishing. Uh, After having left the Yucatan around 6,000 years ago, people uh, people were farming in the Greater Antilles about 4,000 years ago. Evidence of fishing and shellfish collection by then is much more evident. Uh, Another significant change that began happening for these people was a change away from stone tools. 6,000 years ago, the colonists of the Caribbean used far more stone technology than the people of the Caribbean did in later generations. During the first 2,000 years of occupation, objects of stone simply became less and less important. The Caribbean had few large animals that required stone tools, weapons to kill, and as a result, shell, wood, clay, and cotton were all far more useful materials. For the first 2,000 years, these early colonizers from the Yucatan basically had the Caribbean to themselves. 
But soon they would be joined by new groups who had been coming from South America, bringing them with them different ways of life, languages, and other elements of culture. These groups met and over time began to meld. And forevermore, the Caribbean after this became a site of cultural interaction and mutual accommodation. These so-called newcomers, however, had actually started their journey to the Caribbean colonization well before the people who had moved in from Cuba to the Yucatan. The people from South America arrived at Trinidad, the closest island to South America, about 8,000 years ago. Trinidad is quite close to the South American coast, but the rest of the Lesser Antilles is a little bit farther off, which is why there was such a delay in this migration of humans. Trinidad is 13 miles from the coast. The next island, Tobago, also colonized quite early, is only 32 miles from the kilometers from the coast. And, and Tobago is visible from the shore if one is going to sail uh, or canoe to Trinidad. But the next island after that, Grenada, is 125 kilometers away and out of sight beneath the horizon line, assuming you believe the Earth is not flat. So it took a while after that but eventually, and we don't know why, someone eventually did go out past the horizon and found land. Now, with that said, it's quite possible that whoever found Granada knew it was there without having seen it. That's because flocks of birds, plumes of clouds, stuff like this might have given away its location despite it being out of sight. But at any rate, sometime around 5,000 years ago, human beings began colonizing Granada for the first time. Now, these people were not terrestrial hunters, like those who'd come from the Yucatan to Cuba. Instead, they were mainly shellfish collectors, specifically though not crabs, and were also fishing quite a bit. And sometime between this period, between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago, these two groups came into contact with one another. This was the many of... Such encounter. This was the first, excuse me, of many such encounters in the Caribbean, in which two groups of very different cultures would come in contact. In this earlier case, in this earliest case, excuse me, we don't know the nature of the relationship between these groups. So little material culture has survived from the period that we really don't have a good idea of even what sorts of cultural change were taking place amongst these people, or the degree to which it took place. Were people conquered? Did they just kind of start to learn about each other, mix, intermarry, and become one? We don't know. They did have pretty similar technology, but the gulf in language and culture otherwise would have been tremendous. So it, it's also possible that for some time they might have just simply maintained distance between themselves, perhaps trading a bit and having some interaction, but mostly keeping to themselves. After this, the Caribbean stayed mostly the same, other than these two groups culturally melding, culturally that is, there was no major movement of people into the region for another one or two thousand years. But undoubtedly, there was continued contact with the mainland at both ends of the Caribbean. Eventually, though, this would be disrupted by another migration. And this brought people with new technologies, like pottery. Archaeologists call this the Sel Celidadodad phenomenon. We shall return to talk about this topic and many more when we finally do bit back to the prehistory of the Caribbean in episode 2.5, when we conclude People of the Sun in the Caribbean, circa 1491 or so. Now, as for us, I think we better wind down this episode. You know, like I said earlier, I felt it was really important to do this, um... Uh, even if it did just about melt my brain, and you try fitting, I don't know, ten or 12,000 years of history spread out over two continents into one coherent episode and see what it does to you. But frankly, if I hadn't done this, decided to give us a background on the people of the Americas before Columbus, then we'd really have a warped perspective of who the indigenous people of the Americas were. Because while some of the Europeans who arrive in the Americas actually do do a pretty good job of trying to describe these people and their cultures, some of them even attempt to record some of their history. This is all still pretty much done in an effort to help colonize the Native Americans. And frankly, 16th century Europeans actually just don't understand a whole lot about them anyway. And a lot of times are pretty confused when they're trying to uh, describe things. 
So with that said, I, I guess I also could have pretty much skipped this episode and and parts of the upcoming episodes and instead simply focused on on giving a snapshot of indigenous life here in the Americas in, say, uh, 1491. But that would be, as I said, a snapshot. And perhaps ultimately a little better, frankly, than in helping us understand the history of the Americas, if we did that, than if I just simply began with Columbus planting the Spanish flag on Hispaniola. Now, with all of that said, I'm well aware that what I've done with this episode is to simply present additional snapshots of native life at different times and at different places in an effort to show vaguely how societies developed here and why they did. Now, beyond that, I specifically focused on archaeological evidence because I wanted to give a contrasting voice to these early European accounts. Not that archaeology isn't mainly a European-produced science, but at any rate, Hopefully, this is going to help us better understand the later European descriptions of these people and the places that they're going to in the Americas. And with that said, archaeology is not perfect. I'm going to spend a little bit of time when we do wind up in episode 2.5 in the Caribbean as we wind down the series to also talk about, I think, some of the strengths and weaknesses more about the discipline, how I feel about it, um the connection and perhaps what should be a greater connection to history but anyway well you know woo won't that be a pretty wonky um finally though i'd like to finish this episode with just a few more thoughts on clovis because i mean wow what like heroic people these these ancient hunter gatherers these mammoth hunters and i mean the guy who invented the clovis technology i mean he must have been a and live in legend, right? I mean, he revolutionized the hunting of megafauna. He made animals who were fearsome a little less so. Now, I don't think Clovis or his contemporaries were disastrous on their ecosystem in the exact ways that we are today. For one thing, there just simply weren't enough, enough of them to even come close. But as the climate changed during a period known as the Younger Dryas, Clovis people became the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay, technically, they were the straw that broke every back but the camels. But uh, once again, I digress. You see, the climate was changing, and, and, and this must have been, this affected a lot of plant species. And this disruption in plant resources left close people with little choice except to rely more on hunting. And by doing so, uh, they put additional pressures on similarly start starving megafauna. And so these megafauna, simultaneously facing pressures from a changing climate and from the new alpha predator on the block with his new, brand new machine gun of spears, well, most of them just simply went extinct. Now, this is to me a fascinating story. For one, I mean, it's got pretty obvious parallels to our own time. I mean, it's clear to me that modern humans and the Clovis people have an awful lot in common. I mean, so in that regard, what, what interests me about Clovis people isn't some heroic idea uh, about, about cave people hunting mammoth or smilodons or giant sloths or what have you. What really interests me about Clovis people is kind of the same thing that interests me about a lot of the characters and a lot of the superhero stories that Stan Lee wrote, which really isn't the heroics at all. It was their human side. I mean, I love Spider-Man because he struggled. He struggled with grades, with his family, with his friends, with bullies, with work, with girls, hell, with paying his rent and his bills on time. Clovis people struggled too. In part because of their success. They faced a changing landscape with disappearing food sources and a very uncertain future at all. But in the end, they did make it. They prospered, in fact. Even in the Arctic, when facing starvation. Even in the desert 
even in the water even when the water in the desert was poisoned with arsenic even if it meant they had to go so far out to sea that they could not find land or could not see land in doing all of this the descendants of clovis uh, created some of the most marvelous cultures in the history of the world but the lesson for us that the descendants of Clovis leave is that they did all of this, they accomplished all of this by giving up those old tools. Clovis points and the rest, which were once a key to their success, but now literally threatened their very survival. So they gave up those tools and found new ways to live. They replaced old tools with new, and in this way, they survived. Now, we're going to examine these marvelous cultures as, in these upcoming episodes, and we're going to—we're not going to see these people as as like magical beings who who understood nature better than us, or in some ways they did, in some ways they didn't. What we will uncover is that our society is by no means the only kind of society. Now, considering that we and our children and our grandchildren also face an uncertain future from a changing climate and quickly disappearing resources, I think it'd be best if we tried to learn some lessons from the past. At least that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And like I said earlier this episode, I once learned a truth about stories, remember? That the beginning's the least important part. Well, technically, that's not really all that I learned. See, the truth about stories is that even though I have desires for what you should do after listening to this episode, which, for the record in case you can't figure it out, is to help save this planet for our grandchildren and beyond. It is not up to me what happens after you hear this story. The truth about stories is you can react to them any way you wish. Whenever you hear a story, you can get angry, you can get sad, you can laugh, You might just sit and ponder. You can take action. You can retell that story. You might do nothing at all. In fact, the truth about stories, there's really only one thing you can't do after you've heard it. In the years to come, As seas rise, crops fail, fires rage uncontrollably, almost all the people and the animals dead, the oceans are poisoned and dead, and all the world is a desert. You may not, under any circumstances, say the following, if only, if only I had known, if only someone had told me about the descendants of Clovis and their story, how they learned to live a more sustainable life and that I might have learned to do the same. If only I had known that, I would have done something. This you may never do. You have heard this story now. At any rate, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to wear sunscreen, and take care until next episode, and have no fear. Stan Lee is with the Grandfathers now. Hey, you fellow pirates, come and listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command, so let's drop him on and Cause it's a mutiny
the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And I'll take it over the ship. What's happening here? You're no longer in control, and we're drinking up your beer. This is now a democratic, egalitarian pirate ship. So enjoy your trip, uh, 'cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. This is a mutiny, and I'll take it over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny, and I'll take it over the ship. <laughs> 